Okay, well, um, I think we should probably get started. Um, and I'm sure Dan and Jay will probably jump in when they're here. Uh, so the first thing is to uh, call the meeting to order. So the first, well, so I'm gonna call the meeting to order. So the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. Um, so as um, it looks like uh, my uh, sense is that there's gonna be a lot of folks who wanna speak tonight and that's great. Um, but uh, I'm guessing that we may not uh, get through the whole advertised um, agenda here. And so just looking ahead, um, I wanna get a sense of who, oh, who is here. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna um, say that we probably are gonna move the um, chapter 13 ordinance and the lobbying committee to the end uh, in case we need to uh, uh, cut anything. Uh, but beyond that, um, it would be good to, I think if we can still get to um, the uh, parklet ordinance, coronavirus updates, and um, summer schedule and the budget stuff. So uh, with that in mind, um, and also just a, a word about um, the uh, uh, Juneteenth proclamation and the resolution condemning racism and police brutality. Um, I think we're going to take those items probably together, but we'll have a uh, motion. We'll see if there's a motion to remove um, the Juneteenth proclamation um, from the consent agenda. But otherwise, I don't think there's any changes. Anyone have any suggestions um, different than that? Okay. Okay, great. Um, Right, so the next thing is general business and appearances. So this is an opportunity for uh, any member of the public to address an item that is, or a topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. Uh, so just to be clear, if you're here to talk about um, policing, uh, we will be taking that up. And so this would probably not be the time to talk about that. Um, we'll be welcoming comments uh, shortly for that. Uh, but if there's a topic not on our agenda, then, um, that would be, this would be a, a good time to, uh, to talk about that. And so, and this is true for any comments that are made this evening. If you would start with your name and where you live, and then um, try to keep your comments to two minutes, um, especially anticipating that there may be lots of people who want to speak. We want to make sure everybody gets a turn. So um, I will try to let you know when two minutes has gone by. Um, so. Thanks for that in advance. Um, all right, so is there anyone who uh, would like to make a comment um, about some topic otherwise not on our agenda? And uh, you can raise your hand there or um, if you wanna, I'm not sure Cameron, were you saying that people could unmute themselves and like give it a little shout? Oh, you're, yeah, you're still muted. Yeah, I know, I'm sorry. Yes, that would be <laughs> because uh, I'm not seeing anyone raising their hands. Yeah, so uh, if you There's want a, to, if you... There was a thumbs up from a Tracy Canino. I don't know if that was a thumbs up or a hand raising. There you go. That works. So, Tracy. So any sort of emoji, if you don't want to speak, <laughs> up, you can provide Tracy, us one and we will see it. Kim, Tracy, would you like to say anything? I have Kim Watson as well. And Stephanie. It's actually Noel, um, we're here together. Okay. Stephanie and Noel. Okay. Well, let's just start with that. So, um, so Tracy and then Kim and then Stephanie, does that sound, or, or Noel? Yeah. Um, if that sounds good. Okay, go ahead. Hey. <laughs> uh, hello? Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, Tracy, we can hear you. Hi there. I live in uh, District 1 on uh, Deerfield. And um, with the governor's announcement today at the uh, press conference, I just um, was hoping to get some clarity on how involved the council is going to be for the school reopening. Um, obviously, I have a lot of concerns with the kids going back to school. And so I just uh, would like to know how that 
process is going to move forward um, so that we can uh, know how it, how it moves forward and be involved and, and all of that. That's all. It was, it's more of a question than a statement. Sure. Um, so I, I think I could take a stab at this. Um, so the school district is a parallel entity to the municipality, the city of Montpelier. So um, city really doesn't have any um, jurisdiction over the school districts. Uh, we are not hierarchically over them. And uh, so uh, that question would probably be better addressed by the school board um, since there's a, a separation there. Okay, great. Thank Hopefully. you. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. Sorry, I can't be of more help there, but uh, good to know. Um, okay, uh, Kim. Um, Kim, did you want to say anything? Yes, I do. Oh, okay, I go for it. Say, okay. Um, I, I'm the health and safety officer at a Stone Environmental, a business here in town, and have been working uh, heavily on the mandatory requirements set forth by the governor on opening. And we have been open all along um, since we have essential purpose. And I wanted to ask them you to rescind the um, requirement to wear a face mask for uh, retail because it sends the wrong message to our, um, you know, the, the uh, re other requirements that are set forth. So I don't know if that's on the agenda or whether I'll speak to it then, or would you like me to speak to it now and why? That's, that's an interesting question. Um, Cameron, with our uh, COVID-19 update, I assume we'll be talking about masks then? Um, there's not really been any changes to the governor's um, ordinances to specific, I mean, he makes changes to his specific um, uh, groups and different types of businesses and their recommendations, but they don't conflict with what authority he's granted you to provide masks. And there really isn't any um, sector change updates that would impact the municipality right now. So it's not technically included in my update. So, so probably now would be an appropriate time to address the council on that topic. Okay, um, I, I had put in two comments and I guess you guys, you had a firewall up so you could see um, my responses um, to the action that you took forth in that uh, requirement. And one of the things that um, masks are really can only protect you if, if someone sneezes in your space and so rather than focusing on mass as being a requirement, it really should be focused on the cleaning criteria, um, also the criteria to keep sick people out of your facility. And the ordinance that you put forth put was really for retail, which has not been opened. Um, the all the other restaurants, everything else, they've been doing takeout and these requirements have not been put forth so that people can determine whether they wear masks or not. And if a facility does not have the appropriate sanitizers, um, also I think if you look at Shaw's, they have a, in the right signage, then what you're really sending is a message to allow the sick people to come into those facilities versus the well, because not every, if you're, if you can keep the six, six foot distance distancing, then um, you really don't have to wear a mask and you, you're better off breathing fresh air, um, input air into your facility for fresh air and everything. Right now, Washington County has only one in 1,072 people that have been sick. What the message you're sending is telling people if I wear a mask, I'm protected. That is not true. If you wear a mask, you're only protected from the sick. And if people are, fit, I don't know if you've watched anybody, but they're fiddling with their mask, they're touching their mask, they're touching their face. If they're sick and their hands then touch a surface, if you don't send the message to, clean a surface all the time and to do that, then yeah, 
you'll you'll be having more sick people. But since these businesses have been open, there has been no increases of COVID in Washington County. So okay. I just would like to see you rescind that um, proclamation or you know the safety step that you have put in place because it sends the wrong message. Thank so you, Kim. Do you have any questions with regards to what we've set up at our facility? Um, you can you can look it up, but I am following the more mandated um, in the May 15th. May 13th mandated memo from the stay at home order and May 29th, where it clearly states that employees must um, have the sanitizers available to them and the mask requirement is not mandated. Instead, businesses were allowed to do sneeze guards. Okay, so thank you, Kim. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, Take that into consideration. Okay, All right. thank you. Thank you. Um, Stephanie slash Noel. Hi guys. Um, so I'm here to talk about the possibility of having um, Black Lives Matter painted in front of the state house like Washington DC had done. Um, and I just, I don't know, I guess putting it out there as a possibility and like, if it could be a community effort, um, so everybody could come together and do this great thing um, together. I don't know. Um, since this was not otherwise on our agenda, I think now is a pro probably an okay time to chat about this. This is something that we had, there's been a little bit of discussion about. Um, uh, something that I, you know, I think would be. Great, that'd be fine. Um, and I know Connor's done some work on this. Do you want to yes. speak to this, Connor? Yeah, sure. Um, so we've had a lot of conversations this week. Um, mm -hmm. We've had quite a few folks contacting us, mm -hmm. um, saying it would be great if Montpelier was able to send a message as the capital of Vermont uh, by painting Black Lives Matter across from the State House. Mm -hmm. uh, we looked into it. We did see that it was in the state's jurisdiction to actually paint on the street. Um, so I contacted the chief of staff uh, for the governor, Jason Gibbs, and uh, got, got some pretty good news tonight in that uh, Jason Gibbs said that the administration is supportive of a proposal, if we come up with it, uh, to paint Black Lives Matter across the street um, on the state house, uh, right, right by the state house lawn. Uh, the, the only stipulation being that we wouldn't um, you know, block any turn signal lanes, yeah. crosswalks. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I really do think this is, you know, it's symbolic, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it needs to be done in conjunction uh, with examining some of the policies we have around policing, mm -hmm. um, looking at systemic racism, not just in the police department, but in every institution yeah. um, that we have in Montpelier here. So I think it could send a positive message uh, to the state and nationally by Montpelier doing this. Um, so I think we will discuss it maybe in a little bit. It wouldn't be properly warned, so I am going to make a motion at some point tonight to have a special council meeting, um, maybe Friday afternoon, where we could just pop on the phone and properly warn it. Uh, but otherwise, we have Ward Joyce, who's on the uh, phone right now, who's already designed the lettering for it. Wow. Um, we've had people who have offered to volunteer paint, and uh, no Noel, um, I, I, I want to first congratulate you for having such a successful rally this weekend. Mm -hmm. um, it was really moving all the speeches and uh, it, it's really um, wonderful to see everything you've done from when you were at Montpelier High School to what you're doing now, just pushing the cause further. Um, so we, we, we hope we can get this up and running. We'll talk about it Friday, uh, but I hope we're moving in conjunction and uh, mm -hmm. sh should be good if we can pull it off. Definitely. definitely. Oh. So Connor, you're thinking about making that motion a little later in the conversation. I, I, I think I will after we uh, okay. break after talking about some of these okay. issues. That sounds good. Um, go ahead, Dan. I just can, uh, for clarification, uh, you know, if, if this is really in the purview of the state, is there anything that we have to, to decide other than, um, you know, filing some supportive motion? Um, would this, would there be some permission or residual authority that we have as a city that we would want to give as a result of this motion. 
Did you have something in mind? No, I, I, I don't. I just, and this may be more towards Bill or um, I don't know if Connor's looked at this question either, uh, but just understand, you know, if we're meeting Friday to sort of give more of a, a you know, um, a resolution in, in support or, or would this actually be an, an action that they would need uh, to, to do this painting, in which case it, it would be more substantive. I just want to make sure I'm clear on what we what we would be talking about if we had a special meeting. Okay. Well, let's um, take that up in a little bit. Okay. Does that sound okay? Okay, great. Um, is there anyone else for, oh, sorry, did you have something That's more? The, no? um, um, we, I have the event still up for Honor Their Names, and so I'm sure people will be more than happy to come help paint. Um, if that's that, an option. Yeah, if that's an option. I know maybe with COVID that might have to win time slots or what that looks like. And also we're fundraising money for stickers um, that we sold. And so I would be willing to donate some of that money to those are the stickers. I would donate some of that money to painting that in front of the state house. So just to help here, um, the city would need to approve closing the street during the time that the painting was happening. Mm -hmm. uh, presumably we wouldn't want traffic to continue through there. Yeah. And um, the city would probably want to give its okay to uh, the painting on the street. The state, um, because it's a federal aid highway, we get federal and state money for it. Mm -hmm. There's certain requirements for street markings. It's called the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, MUTCD. Okay. So the state, you know, we have to be careful about doing anything that would create a problem from their regard is in terms of obtaining federal highway and state highway aid. Mm -hmm. If the governor's office has said they're okay with it, then they've obviously done, presumably they've checked whoever they need to check with to say that they're okay with. So I think normally what would happen is the city would say, okay, first, then we'd go make sure it was all right with the state. In this case, we've already got the state. Here. So I, I would think yeah. when yeah. the time comes, the city, we're, we're, first we warrant a special meeting for doing this. So we've got time to, to announce it and people can weigh in on it. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, our, our action items would be closing the street on a certain day for a certain period of time mm -hmm. and giving the okay mm -hmm. to the design and all that. Yeah, and I also would like to say like, so we made 642 hearts um, to put into the state house lawn and the next morning, Monday, 3.30 p.m. at night, some 3.30 a.m., sorry, a stranger had gone and taken all those hearts off the state house lawn. So I I think it, that action alone shows that we need this um, and we need this statement because <laughs> I mean, those are real people and we wanted to dispose of those hearts in a more symbolic memorial way. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so thank, um, thanks Bill. Donna, Donna and and then Dan, um, and then I, I gotta confess, I'm, I have not been holding people to two minutes. So I'm gonna try to do a better job. Okay, go ahead, Donna. I just wanna say those hearts were so impressive. I was so disappointed to see them gone. Uh, yeah. I went back Monday specifically to take a picture. Yeah, they went I just thank you for it because it was such a positive connotation. Yeah. I just thought it inspired positive emotions. So thank you for the idea. I'm sorry they didn't, Got, got stolen, but thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Dan, and then I see we have a comment from Thomas Graham. Yep. Sorry, I just, I was gonna follow up. Thanks Bill for that clarification. And I just wanted to be clear, I, I support this as well. Um, and, you know, I think that makes a lot of sense the way Connor's proposing this and, and what Noel has explained for its, its meaning. So I, you know, I know we're going to put this off to later, but I would support a Friday meeting as well. And I think that's, it's a meaningful approval that we need to give. So I'm, I'm glad to do that. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thomas, did you have something you want to say? Yeah. Just related to the question of, you know, what might've happened to these hearts if this was like a vigilante thing, these disappeared. I don't know if anyone recognizes this, how well people can see this. Um, this is a bumper sticker from Patriot Front which is a neo-Nazi hate group that splintered from Vanguard America, the group that uh, a member of which murdered Heather Heyer at the um, rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. And this group is known to be active in Burlington. 
but I found this sticker walking around uh, Monday night on the, it was on that like shipping container with the windows in it, right by the bike path across the river from Shaw's. This sticker, I, I peeled it off, but I just wonder if there's a connection there. And, you know, I'm not sure if this is a local within our town or somebody who's, who's traveling and coming from somewhere else, but, you know, it's just something we should be aware of and, and keep our eyes out for is, is this exists here and we are not immune. Yeah. Thank you. So we actually wrote to Deb Farrell. Yeah. Noel talked to her and I wrote to her. So there's footage of, you know, a person yeah. at 3.30 a.m. That's as far as we've gotten. Mm -hmm. So let's answer that question. And the, Sorry, was that Where? Sunday night? Um, <laughs> Monday, 3.30 in the morning, Monday. Okay. Yes. All right. Monday. Yeah. So, yeah. So just generally team um if you could still continue to raise your hand to speak that would be great um all right so anyone else we for have, general business? yes we have two, two more folks who've been raising their hand jocelyn wolshek and maggie lons lens sorry Lenz, maggie Lenz. okay we'll go in that order uh jocelyn or possibly anthony you're still muted though Here we go. Yes, um, despite the screen name, uh, I'm Anthony Arapino. I live at 4 Saban Street. Um, I uh, want to start my comment, as I always do, by thanking the council for your service. It's a lot of work that you all do for next to no money, um, and it makes a huge difference to our town. So thank our city. So thank you for your service. Um, I'll go quickly on this um, topic, but I, I will not be able to um, participate on Friday, and I just want to voice my support for the notion of painting Black Lives Matter across from the State House. We are the capital city. We are a tourist city. We are a city, unfortunately, though, where I have seen the Confederate flag flying from residences in this town. I have seen it um, in um, residences around this town. I have seen people drive through this town with the Confederate flag. And I think painting Black Lives Matter across the state house, which is some some place that people from all across the state come, um, would be incredibly symbolic, powerfully uh, to send a message that we are welcoming here and that our community um, stands with our black brothers and sisters. And I agree with what Connor said, it is just a symbolic gesture. There's more work to be done, but there is clearly a lot of power in symbolism and uh, I think it would be great if we could do this as a city and I'm willing to lend resources uh, and, and effort uh, as well to this. So I, I, it sounds like the council is supportive and I express my appreciation for the council's support and I will let you get on with your meeting. Thank you. Um, Maggie. Hey guys, thanks Mayor Watson. Thank you city councilors. I just want to add my voice to the chorus supporting this. Thank you, Noel, for bringing this um, forward. This is a great idea. Everyone has already said everything I think that needs to be said, but to reiterate, this shouldn't stand, um, this shouldn't stand as a substitute for other work that we need to do. But um, as a District 1 resident, I would like to show my support. I would like to do anything I can to help um, and show the state and the country and the world that we stand with our black community. Thank you so much. And I also, on a separate note, want to thank you so much for passing the mask ordinance. I felt safer shopping. This is about um, keeping other people safe. Um, I don't think it sends the wrong message. I think it sends a great message. And it's certainly not a stand-in for good hygienic practices. But thank you for passing that ordinance. Thank you. Um, anyone yeah. else? So what was that? Uh, Cam uh, Cameron? Yeah. Oh, Shana. Oh. Yeah, I just raised my okay. hand. Sorry, I was late to this call. Um, yeah, I'm Shana Casper. I'm on Kent Street in Montpelier, and I'm also the chair of the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Council, uh, or committee, sorry. And um, I just also want to appreciate my support for taking up um, this really important and timely issue. And uh, as you all know, the um, Social and Economic Just Justice Advisory Council was, Committee was awarded $10,000 uh, last year to hire an uh, anti-bias consultant um, to run trainings um, and work with the committee to help make Montpelier more um, equitable, and, uh, equ equitable and welcoming to um, uh, to, uh, to very different communities uh, of race and um, social and economic um, class. 
And as part of COVID, um, that funding was taken away, but was committed for the next fiscal year. And um, I, I just want to, you know, uh, make sure that we're still uh, on track to be able to commit that funding to do this really important work as one small piece as part of a larger um, set of reforms around um, social, economic, and racial justice in the state, uh, in this, in the city. So, thank you. Um, and Bill. Yeah. Um, thanks, Shana. Uh, we. We're going to be talking about our budget for FY21. We've got about a $1.4 million deficit uh, to cover. We're making a staff res reg uh, reg recommendation, thank you. But we kept the 10000 in the budget, uh, in our recommendation. That was a commitment of the council, and it certainly is a high priority item. Um, so just, I mean, obviously, council hasn't voted on it yet, but it's, it's not included in the cuts that are being recommended. So hopefully it'll go. Thank you, Bill. And um, thank you, yeah, everyone for, for really prioritizing this really important issue. And again, knowing that it's going to have to be in collaboration with a lot of other, um, you know, really important work that the um, you know, city is going to do. Yep. Cameron, is there anyone else? Um, I can't tell if Mike Donofrio is raising his hand or um, responding to Shana. So I will put him on the spot. Thank you. Uh-oh. Seems like Mike has frozen. Um, okay, well, I'll may, hopefully Mike will unfreeze here in a minute. Uh, but in absence of that, uh, is there anyone else? Okay, so I'm not hearing anybody um, else. And Cameron, you don't have anyone else. If Mike comes back, we'll let me jump back a bit. Um, but we're gonna move on then. So we're on to the consent agenda. Um, is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Uh, go ahead, Jack. I would request, we, even though I suggested it, I request we take the uh, Juneteenth resolution out of the consent agendas and then we would take it up along with the uh, anti-racism agenda or uh, item. Um, that sounds good. Um, second. Oh, seconded. Yeah, okay, so doubly seconded. Um, so, sorry. Um, uh, so, Jack, were you moving the consent agenda absent that item? I had Sarah? not. I had not, but I thought that would be next. But Okay, so we're just... Um, I don't think we actually need to vote on removing a consent agenda item. So um, that's, so we'll just take it right out. And then is there a motion to pass the consent agenda minus uh, item D, the Juneteenth uh, proclamation? So moved. Second. Okay, further discussion on this? Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so the consent agenda passes. Uh, so now we're uh, gonna move on to um, the Juneteenth proclamation along with the resolution condemning racism and police brutality. And so uh, this part of the conversation is gonna go. Um, Jack had brought the Juneteenth proclamation. I think it would probably make sense. Um, I, I know in the past, Jack, you've wanted to read that. Do you want to read it again this year? I am happy to read it. Um, I think that uh, there are probably people uh, present or viewing who have not uh, had a chance to see it yet. And so I think it makes uh, sense to do that. And I have okay. it in, in front of me. Okay. And then, and sorry, if go ahead. I, if I knew how to put it on the screen, I would, but uh, I don't. So I'll just uh, read it. Whereas the history of slavery in the United States is a history of unspeakable brutality and oppression, and whereas the existence of slavery, beginning with the earliest settlements in what became the United States and continuing through the Civil War, was a betray betrayal of the values the United States was created to defend, and whereas the proclamation of the end of slavery in Texas on June 19, 1865, 
long after both the Emancipation and Pro Proclamation and the end of the Civil War is widely regarded as the end of slavery in the United States. And whereas with the experience of over 150 years of history, we now know that the official eradication of slavery was merely a start to the continuing effort to liberate the formerly enslaved people and their descendants. And whereas June 19th, celebrated on, as Juneteenth, celebrates African-American freedom and achievement while encouraging continuous self-development and respect for all cultures. And whereas Juneteenth celebrates the fundamental promise of America and the need for all Americans to continue to work for universal justice and freedom. And whereas the city of Montpelier is committed to the values of liberty and justice enunciated in our Declaration of Independence and Constitution. And whereas the city of Montpelier is further committed to providing a home for all peoples and cultures to form the Montpelier community. Now, therefore, it is resolved that June 19, 2020, there's a typo there, I'm sorry, is recognized in the city of Montpelier as Juneteenth. And it is further resolved that the people of Montpelier are encouraged to celebrate the fundamental American values that underline the founding of our nation, our state, and our city and to recommit themselves to the cause of liberty, justice, and acceptance of all people. And I move that we adopt this resolution. I second. So thank you. Um, and so just so folks are aware, uh, we're gonna move this uh, item, then we'll have a conversation about um, and then we'll have a, a broader conversation about uh, policing in general, just so everyone knows where we're going. Um, so uh, there's a motion and a second. Um, is there any further conversation on this item? Okay. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you. So that motion. Thank you so much for uh, bringing that to us, Jack. Thank you. Um, and uh, for the resolution condemning uh, racism and police brutality, um, I'm going to turn this over to Lauren. Thank you. Um, so I had brought forward this resolution, uh, and really I'm excited that it is spurring the conversation that I hoped it would. I'm so pleased to see such engagement from the community and so many people here looking forward to this conversation. Um, so, Anne, do you want me to read the resolution to lay the groundwork and um, and we can deal with that and then have the conversation process-wise? I, I think that would be good, yeah. Okay, so um, this is a resolution condemning racism and police brutality. Whereas, we are outraged at the recent killings of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and countless others, and the city of Montpelier condemns all forms of racism and police brutality and supports and commits to protecting all of its residents. And whereas these recent tragedies have once again shown a light on systemic racism and the current and historically disparate treatment of African-Americans and black people in our country, and whereas data show racial disparities in the criminal justice system in Vermont, including one of the highest per capita rates of incarceration of black men of any state in the nation, and whereas we support and commit to calling out hate and discrimination when we see it, and to promote our core American value that no one should be targeted because of their identity, and whereas violence hate crimes and police brutality create fearful and unstable communities. And as public servants, we have a responsibility to speak out against racism, discrimination, and bias. And whereas the Montpelier City Council recognized that historical and ongoing systems and structures in our nation, state, and community perpetuate racism, sexism, heterosexism, classism, ableism, and other forms of injustice and oppression, and in response created the Montpelier Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee to help the city address and reshape the systems, policies, and practices that perpetuate these barriers to social and economic justice in our community. 
and whereas the Montpelier City Council prioritized the creation of an inclusive, equitable, and engaged community where all people are treated with respect and dignity in our 2020 and 2021 strategic plan, and whereas law enforcement officers in the city of Montpelier have made important strides in building trust and legitimacy in policing, working to foster open and honest dialogue in our community, but ongoing work remains, and whereas the city of Montpelier affirms and commits to protect the rights of all people, including the Black Lives Matter movement and justice allies and activists in our community who speak up and protest and demand justice for all, and whereas we stand together to fight any form of bigotry, discrimination, or hate in speech or action against any group from whatever the source, now therefore be it resolved that the Montpelier City Council and Mayor wholeheartedly condemn the actions and injustices, including police brutality and racism, that have again divided and harmed our community, state, and country. And be it further resolved that the City of Montpelier recommits to engaging our community members to address and uproot institutionalized racism and implicit bias and offer spaces for dialogue, trainings, and understanding, and be it further resolved that the city of Montpelier will continually work to ensure it is implementing bias-free policing, actively working to reduce disparate impacts on historically marginalized communities and creating systems and procedures that ensure robust transparency, oversight, and accountability and be it further resolved that the Montpelier City Council and Mayor will strive to do everything in its power to make certain that Montpelier is and will remain an inclusive, equitable, and engaged city opposed to acts of racism and bigotry. So I move we adopt this resolution. I'll second. Okay. Um, so we could, um, I, I'm feeling that we, no one is going to be opposed to that. So I feel like we should um, vote on that. And then I'd like to have a, a discussion because this, this feels like right? Like we have this opportunity here to uh, be self-reflective about our policing in Montpelier and there's always space to do better. And so um, looking forward to, all right. So, uh, any further discussion on this resolution? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so, oh, I'll just uh, share to, uh, I just want to oh, share sorry, with everyone that Dan Richard, Richardson's internet had gone out, he let me know, so he was not on that vote in case people are wondering why he's not present. He's still working on it. Great, thank you. Um, Donna, did you? Before we get into the in-depth discussion, I just really wanna thank Lauren and her writing and whoever helped her. This is such an exquisite proclamation. Thank you and thank everybody who participated in doing it. Yes, I agree. Oh, we have Dan back, that's great. Um, Dan, just FYI, we just voted on um, the resolution. Um, okay, so now at this point, um, I would like to, um, op op uh, so I'm going to say this and then I'll get to you, Jack. Um, Jack, we're going to call, we're going to hear from Jack and then um, I'd like to um, hear from the public and I'm sure lots of folks have things they want to say. So um, if you can be raising your hand, let Cameron know, and then I'll check in with Cameron as to who would like to speak and we'll go from there. Um, Jack. I was just going to request that we reopen the vote on that resolution so that uh, Dan would have the opportunity to go on record in support of it. That's a good call. Um, I I am not technically sure how to reopen a vote. Does anyone know how to do that? Well, it's definitely going to take some kind of motion. I'll have to check the book though, just a minute. So, um, so I think someone who, sorry. No, no, you go ahead, go ahead. I, th I think someone who can, uh, who voted yes, which is all of us, can move to reconsider with the idea being that we would reconsider and then we would be six votes in favor. So I'm going to vote, move to reconsider the uh, vote on the resolution. I'll second, I'll second that. Okay. Um, so there's been a motion and a second to reconsider. Uh, all in favor, oh, any further discussion? Okay. All in favor. Yeah, and yeah, I presume the only people that could vote would be the ones who voted on the prior motion to reopen. I think I, so. I think, 
I think that's probably true. Um, all right, so all in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, opposed? Okay, so we'll reconsider that vote. Is there? I move we adopt the resolution condemning racism and police brutality. Second. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that's the motion passes and um, that was unanimous with all six votes. Okay, um, great, thank you for, for that. Um, all right, so Cameron, yeah. um, how are we doing? For I don't see anyone actively yeah. raising their hands. Make an emoji, raise your hands. Um, I'll put you all in a list. Mm -hmm. right, hold on, Mayor, I'm sorry. That's okay. Right now we just have as far as I can tell, um, Carolyn Wesley and Stephanie Gamori and uh, Laura. Oh, oh, is that Lauren Griswold or is that someone else? No, it just says Laura. Okay, we'll go. Um, we'll go. Carolyn, then Stephanie, then Laura. Lauren, I see your hand, um, and so you'll be and then Laura, um, and then David. Okay, and David Hershey? Yes. Okay, so David um, will go after that. All right, and I, I am gonna try to keep people to two minutes. I'll just let you know when two minutes is, is up and then just try to uh, wrap your comments up there if you can. Um, okay, uh, Carolyn, go ahead. Hi, Anne. I, I just wanna use a piece of my two minutes in public service to let people know, you can obviously raise your hand physically with the video, but in Zoom, if you click on the participants button, a window will open where there's a button to raise hands. So if anyone didn't know how to raise hands, that's how you do it. And, and again, I, I, think, I think people are looking if you just raise your hand too. I also <laughs> want to acknowledge that I got called before Stephanie. Um, part of the statement that I'm going to read uh, was drafted by Stephanie building on her word. So I just want to give an acknowledgement to that. Um, so I want to thank the council for the resolution condemning racism and police, police brutality um, I think we all know and has already been acknowledged today that words are not enough to address the centuries of genocide, slavery, colonialism, brutality, disenfranchisement, and discrimination against Native, Black, and other people of color that have taken place in Vermont and in our Montpelier community. What I most want to impress upon you today is that since we all acknowledge through this resolution and the Juneteenth Procl Proclamation that neither safety and protection under the law nor opportunity to thrive exist equally for everyone in our current community structure, we are called to restructure and to think about different ways to be in community with one another. With that in mind, I'm asking you to take concrete steps now to truly make Montpelier the inclusive, equitable, and engaged community you imagine. And this includes examining why and how police function to begin with and acknowledging that policing has its roots in white supremacy and racism. I acknowledge that up until now, I've not been an active in community conversations around policing or other forms of restorative justice. And I recognize that there may be good work underway that can be built upon and accelerated at this, this moment. But it is clear that the city faces significant budgetary pressures as a result of the pandemic. And I think this presents an opportunity to reconsider funding priorities in light of the demands of black and brown people across this country. Some of those demands include removing police from schools, permanently reducing the number of police officers immediately, starting with those who have been have used excessive force, banning the procurement of military equipment and surveillance technology, disarming the police, diverting funding from disproportionately large police budget into social resources, including the underfunded and volunteer-based community justice center, arranging for a budget shortfall resulting from COVID-19 to come exclusively out of the police budget and not to disrupt other city services, to certify, to certify and disbanding police unions and not entering into further collective bargaining agreements with organizations that represent the police, recognizing that police unions keep officers from facing consequences and working towards creating new structures of justice, emergency response and conflict resolution with the ultimate goal of abolishing the police. 
I recognize two minutes right now. Sorry. (laughs) Go ahead. Uh, Well, then I'll just finish up saying policing is not the only institution where systemic racism shows up. There are other challenges for black and other people of color in our community that should be tended to. And all of that requires resources. So it makes sense to prioritize city fundings for programs that value and respect and promote the dignity of all individuals. Thank you. Can I I just ask, Madam Mayor, for people like Carolyn Restefi, anybody else has has prepared statements, could you send them in just because a lot to write down so that we have the full text of what you're asking for. It makes it easier in the future when we want to review and respond. So. Yes. Yep. Can, what, what's the best uh, place email, email to send that email. to? You send okay. it to me, Carol. That's fine. Thank. thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Stephanie, and then uh, Thomas, I see your hand. So um, Thomas, you would go after David. Go ahead, Stephanie. Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening to us tonight. I want to say Montpelier is obviously a special place, a place where we will apparently be emblazoning Black Lives Matter on our major thoroughfare. But here's what worries me, and I know it worries other people as well. I'm worried that in a political climate where our president and other politicians spew such intense hatred and overt racism, that we in Vermont feel simply saying the right thing is enough. I'm here to make it clear that the people of Montpelier know the difference, as some of you have alluded to. We know that these words and even big symbolic gestures are the absolute bare minimum. Words and symbols are not enough to address the centuries of genocide, slavery, colonialism, and brutality against Native, Black, and other people of color that have taken place in Vermont, or even KKK rallies that took place right here in this city. So we want to see action that leads to systemic change. I'm here to demand that the city of Montpelier take concrete steps now to truly make Montpelier the inclusive, equitable, and engaged community that you all imagine. This includes examining why and how police function to begin with, and acknowledging that policing has its roots in white supremacy and racism, and there is no getting around that. So we demand you remove police officers from the Montpelier school system immediately, permanently reduce the number of police officers, starting with those who have used excessive force, such as Chad Bean, who fatally shot Mark Johnson in Montpelier last summer, pass a resolution banning the procurement of military equipment and surveillance technology, disarm the police, divert funding from the disproportionately large police budget into the underfunded, volunteer-based Montpelier Community Justice Center, arrange for the budget shortfall resulting from COVID-19 to come exclusively out of police budget as not to disrupt other services that the city provides, work towards creating new structures of justice, emergency response, and conflict resolution with the ultimate goal of abolishing the police. Please put your money where your mouth is and demonstrate what the city truly values. Defund the police and fund programs that value and respect the dignity of all individuals because the police inherently does not. Thank you. I just want to say we are watching your progress and if these demands are not met, we will be back and we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay, um, Laura. Is um, there a Laura who would like to speak? Hi. Hi. Yes, I can hear you. And name. would you say your, if you wouldn't mind saying your whole name and just where you live? Right. My name is Laura Baker, and I live in Montpelier, and I'm here with my three friends. Uh, I'm Claire Coston. I live at 16 Hubbard Street. And I'm Rachel Temple. I'm Claire's roommate. Um, I also live at 16 Hubbard Street. And essentially, we're all gathered here today to um, piggyback on the words of Carolyn and Stephanie. Um, we have the same exact demands as they do. Um, I'm not going to read out the prepared statement because I think that that's going to be emailed to you. Um, but we all feel extremely strongly about that, and we think that um, it will make a much more um, fair and tolerable place to live. Um, so that's four of us here who um, are in agreement on um, those demands that were listed previously. Okay. And um, John, uh, anything more from Laura and the folks with her or are we good? Uh, I, good. Couldn't, I could not make out the other names. Um, thank you for bringing that up. The other folks who are there. Want us to repeat it? Yes, please. We, I got Laura Baker. That's all I got too. 
I, I, I'm Claire Costin and Rachel Kempel. We both live at 16 Hubbard, apartment three. Okay. I think I got that. And okay. then Frank Costin, who lives on Paris Street. Sorry, I did not get that. Gray Austin, he lives on, or they live on Paris Street. Okay. Okay, great, okay. thank you. Okay, um, Lauren Griswold, I think you are next. Hi guys, uh, I'll try and just get right to it. Um, I really appreciate your resolution, your um, interest in this symbolic gesture of painting Black Lives Matter in front of the State House. Um, and I do just want to, I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with the fact that Mayor Bowser of DC came under some heat for um, a little hypocrisy, uh, the disparity between the symbolic gesture and the lack of responding to the Black Lives Matter schemes. One of the main uh, calls to action is defunding police and she's uh, seeking to raise the police budget this coming year and she's come under some heat for that. So. I'm also echoing Stephanie's comment here um, and would would ask you guys to keep that in mind, that a, a symbolic gesture like that is beautiful and it uh, will spur powerful action in its own right, but it's really important that it comes coupled with action from the city. Um, so I'm here to urge you to take decisive action now in response to the tragic murder of George Floyd and the countless black men and women he has come to represent. Our country, our state, and our city needs systemic change and we need it now. This starts with an acknowledgement of the issues inherent in American policing. One cannot watch the barrage of police brutality we've all seen these past two weeks in response to protests and not conclude there is something gravely wrong in the culture and system of the American police force. And there is no asterisk there that excludes mobility. And reform are helping. Most of the value of living in place cities with progressive police reform. But what good is reform if a culture and a mindset of violence, control, and rage overrides protocol? If officers function above the law with qualified immunity and police unions stand by them when the public sees. Reforms have proven themselves an inadequate response to the crisis at hand. We don't need to pay the more rules they won't follow. We need to begin the process of reimagining public safety. We need a public safety plan that funds the support and reduces crime instead of one that strips social support and funds the management of the resulting crime. To begin this process, I want to echo my neighbor's demand, namely the do some for police officers immediately, starting with those who have used the force. If that feels like it will strain the remaining staff out for a portion of police duties to professionals equally or more prepared to handle them. Pass a resolution banning the procurement of military equipment and surveillance technology, divert funding from the disproportionately large police budget to the underfunded volunteer based Mont Montpelier Community Justice Center. To disband the police union and do not enter into any further collective bargaining agreements with organizations that represent the police. Work towards creating new structures of justice, emergency response, and conflict resolution with the ultimate goal of abolishing the police. And then, Lauren, you're, and you're, you're at about two minutes right now. That this city truly values liberty and justice for all. Defund the police, invest in programs that strengthen community resilience, mental health, and economic opportunity for all our residents. And this won't blow over. I hope you guys will. Okay. Well, that's pretty much it. I just hope you guys will take this moment as the watershed moment that it is, um, or you'll just keep hearing from us. So Lauren, you were sort of cutting in and out a, a, a bit there. So if you have anything written down that you want to send us, that would also be welcome and helpful. Um, but thank you. Cool. Uh, all right, um, David. I am David Hershey. Um, I'm a resident of East Montpelier. I don't know if that affects my ability to speak in this forum at all. It does not, but thank you for letting us know. Okay. Um, so I'm here to just echo this, the demands of those before me who've already spoken um, for the same reasons, because it's incredibly important to take not only symbolic action, but to actually change the policies of our city 
uh, in order to um, to uh, to use Stephanie's words to to put our money where our mouth is, right? Um, so I'm just going to relist those demands real quick uh, so that others can speak. Those demands are to remove police officers from the Montpelier school system, to permanently reduce the number of police officers immediately, starting with those who have used excessive force, such as Chad Bean, who fatally shot Mark Johnson in Montpelier last summer, to pass a resolution banning procurement of military equipment and surveillance technology, to disarm the police, to divert funding from the disproportionately large police budget into underfunded volunteer-based Montpelier Community Justice Center, to arrange for budget shortfall, um, arrange or to compensate for the budget shortfall from COVID-19 um, by taking money out exclusively out of the police budget so as not to disrupt other services that the city provides, um, to decertify and disband the police union uh, and not enter into any further collective bargaining agreements with organizations that represent the police, and to work towards creating new structures of justice, emergency response, and conflict resolution with the ultimate goal of abolishing the police. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, I think Mayor, next, can I jump in real quick? Yes, go ahead. Our list has gotten ex uh, much longer, so I just wanted to update okay. you on where we we're at. Okay, great. Um, so we have Allison, and some people might not have been raising their hands, but reacting. So if they don't want to say anything, that's up to them. But we have Allison, Shana, Thomas, Julia. Constantin, uh, I'm so sorry. Um, Constantinos? Yes. yes. Um, Bogdan, Kate Brown, Ira. Hang on, oh, hang on. Bogdan, Kate <laughs> Brown, and then, and then who? Ira and Rebecca. Ira and Rebecca. Okay, so we will go, um, actually, I, I, I think I was going to be calling on Thomas next because I saw his hand. So we'll go um, Thomas and then Allison, Shana, Julia, Constantinos, Bogdan, Kate, Ira, Rebecca. Okay. And again, I'll try to let you know when two minutes has gone by so that we can um, keep going. Uh, okay. So I think uh, Thomas, you are up. Go ahead. All right. Yeah. I would also echo those demands. I think um, all of that is reasonable. And just as a procedural question, I was wondering the way um, presently there are certain line item budget uh, issues like the library that are separate from voting up or down the entire municipal budget and maybe a way to achieve or at least make a direct democracy out of and kind of put to the public uh, the question of police funding and possibly achieve defunding the police. Would it be possible to make the police budget in particular a line item that's separate from the overall municipal budget so that voters can vote on that separately from uh, other issues. Um, before we um, address that, actually, could, I, I think, I'd, uh, is there anything else you wanna um, add to that, uh, Thomas? No, just a, just a theoretical question. Okay. Um, so just in general, in the past, we have not split out uh, particular departments, um, though that's something we can consider. But usually it's um, uh, while that would increase, uh, you know, the democratization of um, voting there, um, it's usually not considered best practice um, because it's because the city budget is all as a whole thing. And so we um, try to keep it together uh, if it's if it's under the, the auspices. But you know, the thing we can talk about. Um, so thank you. If I could just um, weigh in on that too quickly. Okay, um, Allison. And then, yeah, no, good. Go ahead, Allison. Hi, I'm Allison Burns. I also live in East Montpelier. Um, and right now I teach eighth grade math at Randolph Union High School. And in the fall, I'll be teaching at U32. Um, and I just wanted to echo the demands that have been made. It should be abundantly clear right now that speaking out against racism is not enough. Fighting racism is an urgent issue and we need to be actively working towards being anti-racist as individuals, but also as a city. This does not just come from condemning racism with our words, but instead by taking immediate action to make sweeping changes to the systems that have been built on white supremacy to oppress the black community. We demand the following, remove police officers from Montpelier schools immediately. There is no place for police officers in schools. Looking back now, I have been complicit in this. I have sat in countless meetings 
for you know kids who have truancy issues or drug issues. And we've had an armed police officer in those meetings, and that is completely inappropriate and does the opposite of solving the problem. Um, if we also are demanding that we permanently reduce the number of police officers immediately, starting with those who have used excessive force, such as Chad Bean, who fatally shot Mark Johnson in Montpelier last summer. Pass a resolution banning the procurement of military equipment and surveillance technology, disarm the police, divert funding from the disproportionately large police budget into the underfunded volunteer-based Montpelier Community Justice Center, arrange for budget shortfall resulting from COVID-19 to come exclusively out of police budget as not to disrupt other services that the city provides, police unions keep officers from facing consequences, decertify and disband the police union and do not enter into any further collective bargaining agreements with organizations that represent the police and then work towards creating new structures of justice, emergency response, and conflict resolution with the ultimate goal of abolishing the police. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to uh, um, check in with the city manager. So uh, we're hearing a lot of the same items come up over and over again. Um, do you have all of these listed, like um, written down? Yeah, and we, got Car we have Carolyn's email as well. We've already received. Okay. Um, so just a note to folks that um, we um, got those all written down. And so you could, as an option, if you want, you can just say, I support that same list. Um, but feel free to um, elaborate or um, add your own uh, ideas as well. Um, OK, so Shana. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to express my support as an individual, not as a member of the committee. Um, and then I also just did have a question about how the school resource officer was funded and if that was through the uh, city budget or if that was separate, um, you know, uh, with, with the city council or with the school committee. Um, is that the extent of the things that you want to say? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to oh, express okay. my support. I can okay. yield the rest of my time to someone else who needs to go over. Cool. Um, all right. So, um, Bill, do you want to um, explain uh, that? Uh, the school resource officers split 50-50 between the city budget and the school budget. Um, obviously, they do work in the schools, uh, counseling and other, other work, as well as during when schools close, they're offering working as a patrol officer. So we've had that 50-50 split down for a long time. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay, Julia. Hi, I was just reacting, but I live at 2 Lewis Street, and I will, since I have the floor for this, this moment, I will also support the list of demands, and um, I appreciate all those who organized to bring them forward. Thank you. Um, I believe we are up to Bogdan. Hello. Uh, can I speak if I don't live in Montpelier? You may. Just tell us where you do live. Hi, I live uh, in Barrie, right next, and I'm I'm interested in this since we are neighboring communities, and if anything happens in Montpelier, it will affect Barrie and vice versa. Okay, so, thank you. So, thank you very much for having me. Uh, time is of the essence, so I'll be brief. Uh, the reason I joined today is because of the recent Facebook uh, and front porch forums regarding defying the police. We do have a racism problem in America, and it is not a small problem. It affects lives every day, regardless of age, and it is sad and it's bad and heartbreaking that in 2020, we are still judging people based on their skin color. It is unacceptable, and this must end. Uh, the online post stated that Montpelier, we are watching, thank you for anti-rhetoric, um, anti-racist rhetoric, and put it into action. Defund the police to make our community safer. My question is, are the two exclusives? Can we have an inclusive, anti-racist, and safe community, community without defunding the police? I believe the answer is yes. One major concern I have, honestly, is that we are trying to do something here based on what is going on around the country. Yes, last events are appalling. However, does Montpelier have an actual issue in terms of police racism? A few things that are demanded are to reduce the number of police officers immediately starting with those who have used excessive force. It feels that we are automatically deeming any and all officers that have ever used force guilty without addressing the circumstances surrounding those actions. That is no different than convicting anyone of assault if that action was taken in self-defense. 
also to pass a resolution banning the procurement of military equipment and surveillance technology. Are we talking about banning any and all military equipment or just particular categories? Because three years ago, when Orlando saw an active shooter, a military helmet saved a police officer's life. We are talking about disarming the police. I genuinely cannot imagine personally this happening and still having a safe police department. But if we are condoning any violence, we have a moral obligation of condemning all violence. And police are experimenting the same violence as well. Police officers are still being attacked, assaulted, shot, etc. And these days, I understand how it is hard to realize it and feel for it. But there are some amazing cops out there. There are really some amazing officers that understand what policing is, that are focused on their community, and they are involved in the community, and they want to make their community better. And the most important thing, the one that really I am passionate about, they care about the young generation. Because if we do not invest in our young people, what good are we? Bottom line, I don't think it is wise to attack Montpelier Police Department for the actions of other officers in the country. This is no different. And you're, you're at about two minutes right now. This is no different than what the far right is doing at the moment, blaming Black Lives Matter for recent riots, when the ones that actually believe in change and they do believe in Black Lives Matter are protesting peacefully for change. That being said, I 100% agree with discussing the police budget. I think it's a good topic to discuss, and thank you very much for the time. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and Konstantinos, I'm so sorry I skipped you. So um, Konstantinos, you are up next. You are muted, I think. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So the city council's resolution condemning racism and police brutality declares responsibility of Montpelier's public servants to speak out against racism, discrimination, and bias. But words are not enough to address the centuries of genocide, slavery, colonialism, brutality against native, black, and other people of color that have taken place in Vermont, or the KKK rallies that have happened here in this very city. We just heard earlier on this very meeting about white supremacists active in our city today. Uh, words, symbolic gestures, and reformism are nice, but have never been enough. I'm an abolitionist, and when I say abolish the police, I mean abolish all racist and white supremacist institutions, including policing. We must implement new systems of justice, emergency response, and conflict resolution. If you just browse the police media logs here in the city, I'm sure most of you will agree, an armed individual is not the best way to respond to these community issues. I know abolition won't happen overnight, but it's a long process we all must go through together as a community. This includes examining why and how police function to begin with, and acknowledging that policing has its roots in white supremacy and racism. I'm here to demand as a first steps and bare minimum towards this goal that the city of Montpelier take concrete steps now to truly make Montpelier the inclusive, equitable, and engaged community we imagine. So we demand uh, the following. Remove police officers from Montpelier schools. Permanently reduce the number of police officers immediately, starting with those who have used excessive force, such as Chad Bean, who fatally shot Mark Johnson in Montpelier last summer and was returned to duty before an external investigation was even completed trivializing the investigation and essentially rubber stamping the use of deadly force by police, insulting all those who have been victims of police violence. Even if he's just one bad apple, any coworker that tolerates this type of behavior is just as guilty. Uh, also, pass a resolution banning the procurement of military equipment and surveillance technology. Disarm the police, divest, uh, divert funding from the disproportionately large police budget into the underfunded volunteer-based Montpelier Community Justice Center, arrange for budget shortfall resulting from COVID-19 to come exclusively out of police budget, and not to disrupt other city services. Decertify and disband the police union. Do not enter into any further collective bargaining agreements with organizations that represent the police. Police union's purpose is to keep officers from facing consequences. And work towards creating new structures of justice, emergency response, and conflict resolution with the ultimate goal of abolishing the police. Uh, Mariam Kaba, a fellow abolitionist and researcher at Barnard College said in a recent interview, everything you see in the world, somebody thought of first. Once things are actualized into the world and exist, you can't imagine how the world functioned before it. It's like we develop amnesia. You just assume, assume things have always been as they are. I wholeheartedly agree with this sentiment. Tomorrow does not have to look like today. I implore you to recognize the colonial and white supremacist origins and structures being upheld by policing. Even if our police department here in Montpelier is not problematic to you personally, and and think about the damage that this institution has done to you're indigenous gonna, communities and communities of color. about two minutes right now. Just and how Go ahead, these please. institutions affect those within our city. So mayor, council members, city manager, some of which you, I saw marching on Sunday uh, in the street, put your money where your mouth is and demonstrate what the city truly values. 
defund the police, fund instead programs that value and respect the dignity of all individuals. So we'll be watching and if these demands are not met, we'll continue. You'll continue to hear from us. Great. Hey, thank you. Um, all right, Kate Brown. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah. great. Um, thanks. Thanks for having us. Um, I do want to welcome Chief Pete to our community uh, amidst such an important time. Oh, this is a woman I'm talking about. That's always, that's Kate's, uh, that's Carolyn's friend. Um, oh, hey, Constantinos, I think you're not are, muted. Not muted. <laughs> there you go. You were just go ahead, talking Kate. about me. <laughs> Um, I do want to voice my support for the Montpelier residents speaking out today and for the mission of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. We have really an unprecedented opportunity to create new structures of justice, emergency response, and conflict resolution uh, with the ultimate goal of abolishing the police um, as we know it. The divesting from our armed police force should be rooted in immediate investment in services related to physical and domestic abuse, drug addiction and overdose, and mental health emergencies. These are areas of trauma affecting the health of our community. Uh, we must also place a priority on the training and wellness of our peace officers. Uh, the new city police budget does mention share of a social worker housed within Washington County Mental Health Services. Um, I'm really heartened that this represents a tiny step in the right direction with so much more to do. Um, so I just want to say I hope to raise my young family here in Montpelier in a community where everyone can access care and help in an emergency without fear of a militarized response or physical harm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Ira. Hi, my name is uh, Ira Shattis. I live on Main Street in Montpelier. Um, so I would just say that I uh, I fully agree with this idea of uh, abolishing the police, and that should be the goal. Um, in particular, I do want to emphasize the sort of process where Chad Bean uh, ended up back on the street uh, before the external uh, investigation was complete. I don't know all the details, but something seems uh, amiss uh, there. Um, I would also say that, you know, if, if you can't stomach the idea of abolishing the police, if that's too much of a conceptual leap, I still have the question of how, how come the, the police budget is as large as it is? Why is it such a big piece of uh, the city's budget? And then is that money being spent effectively? I mean, what is in place to ensure that there is, uh, some some metric or some measure that uh, what they're doing is is worth our money and worth our time. Uh, I think there's a growing body of evidence that points to uh, other institutions and other structures as providing safer, healthier, happier communities. Uh, and so I think you know if if you want to be practical about it, then hold hold up the police. Uh, uh, as an institution against other institutions. Um, you know, Constantino said uh, something about things uh, needing to be imagined, but there's people around the country who are imagining things and have, have good ideas. There are uh, ideas for civilian review, uh, review boards. Uh, there are ideas uh, for uh, community justice centers like our poor underfunded one uh, in town here. And I think that it's um, actually the, the practical thing to uh, look at uh, the comparative impact of, of those institutions versus um, the police. And that's it. Thank you very much. Um, okay, Rebecca. Um, hi, I'm Rebecca Dalgan. I live on Greenwood Terrace, um, I believe in District 1. Um, I just wanted to uh, voice my support. Um, for the statement that Stephanie and Carolyn made. And I also, I don't know if this is the appropriate uh, place to ask questions, but I'm given the support that it's shown, uh, has been shown for it here, I'm wondering what the council's next um, steps are um, regarding this. And um, thank you. Great, thank you. Well, and I, I think the next steps is probably gonna be part of our discussion. Um, so uh, Cameron, is there anyone else? Yes, uh, Kim Watson and Elizabeth Parker raised their hands. Okay, um, Kim, go ahead. Uh, Kim, you are still muted. I'm mute. Um, I'd like to thank the Montpelier Police for all the hard work they've done. They've definitely um, 
taking care of drug drug addictions and working in all of those areas areas and I do not support the defunding of the police. If anything, I would recommend additional training in brutality and in those kind of sources to help them get educated on how to work um, with different populations. And that's all I have to say. Okay, thanks very much. Um, all right, and Elizabeth. Hi. Um, well, I too would like to welcome uh, uh, Brian Peet, uh, and of course, thank Tony for uh, his years of service. After uh, Mark's uh, death, I uh, attended city council and asked for uh, more uh, on-foot policing downtown so that uh, so that the police really start to have relationships with um, the residents uh, in the higher density uh, areas that are uh, mostly affected uh, by uh, the challenges of mental health uh, and, uh, and also um, areas where uh, potentially there's a higher use of drugs. And uh, I have to say, uh, you know, I, I, I have not, I have yet to see uh, that type of policing happening. And I really hope that as we move towards a different model of how we interact with one another, that uh, as long as the police department exists, as uh, that we take more time to build relationships with those people most in need so that when critical uh, ex uh, incidents happen, that uh, there's a better understanding of the situation by all the police. And uh, I think that many important, uh, you know, concepts have been raised here tonight uh, that need to be evaluated and uh, and many need to be adopted. And so I just hope that in the interim, we can have some basic shifts that will help uh, in building the relationships that are necessary to have the kind of policing that, heart-based policing that we really want here in Montpelier. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay, um, Cameron, anyone else? I don't see anyone, so uh, sort of final call on that, I guess. Okay, yeah, anyone else? Okay, well, so I wanna thank everyone who spoke. I appreciate um, your time and uh, attention to uh, the details of uh, that might apply in Montpelier. So I appreciate that. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I do think that um, there are, there's always, there's always improvement. We, um, we did hire a, a social worker this year. Um, and we've also, we're also funding a street outreach person for, um, uh, working with our unsheltered community, but there's absolutely things that need to be and can be better. So, um, in any case, uh, so the question I think is, um, where do we want to go from here council? So I'll, I'll turn it over to you. What comments, um, or ideas, or what are you hearing? Um, where do you want to go? Uh, Connor, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to start and thank everybody who uh, spoke today. It's uh, I was at the rally too this weekend. And I, I, I think there's like, you know, there's a passive activism you can take to hold a sign and everybody's singing the same chants and you're all like on the same page, right? Um, it's, it's a step further to actually take it to a body like this and come with uh, concrete solutions that you're offering and be willing to have the discussion. Uh, so when folks say like, okay, we, we might keep coming back, I would say we would welcome you to come back any council meeting. We're, uh, we're really a volunteer board here um, and we can use the expertise and, and have a community discussion and come up with some of the best outcomes. 
Um, I, I also want to uh, thank Chief Vakos, um, because since, since I've been on City Council, um, I, I've been very impressed by the Chief's commitment to President Obama's 21st century policing policy, which, which I think really outlines some of the best practices. And I think the reason we're able to have a conversation like this uh, is because the Chief has been so open to feedback, um, always improving. And uh, I, so I just want to thank him as he's stepping down, he's stepping down at a very hard time. Um, and it must be difficult to hear these discussions to some extent. Um, I also want to welcome uh, new Chief Pete here. He's going to bring a ton of new ideas, a ton of new experiences that I'm sure we can all learn from and, and, and improve going forward. One thing I want to say is uh, I think all of us are having individual discussions with activists in the community. I know I've had a, like two or three already this week. Um, I, I, I think we need some time to process this, but um, Anne is on the phone who spoke last week. She's a resident of Barry Street. Uh, and Officer Mike Philbrick and I sat down, was it yesterday or the day before, had a coffee. Um, and, and Anne is an example of somebody who came with an idea of maybe a community advisory group uh, who could not be under the Montpelier Police Department, but maybe, you know, the Community Justice Center or something, uh, that would create a two-way conversation uh, with community members and the police force. It's something I'd really be interested in exploring. Um, as a way that people could offer feedback without fear of any repercussions or anything. Um, I think we could use the community justice center model a lot to do mediations if somebody was pulled over and just in like the treatment on a stop or something, that might be a mechanism, but also sort of a, a, a way we can come up with some solid ideas and, and maybe incorporate them to the budget. So I think we've got a lot of good ideas. I, I, I think, and it was fair to say mayor that, you know, again, the, uh, homeless liaison position, the uh, social worker position, uh, maybe having a conversation about S SROs ro roles in the school. I think these are great discussions to have, uh, but it's not gonna be solved overnight. And I think with any movement, it, it, it's more than the rallies, it's keeping the momentum going, going keeping coming to these meetings. Uh, and just wanna, wanna say I really appreciate it. And uh, I, I think I can speak for the whole council when I say we're, you know, we're all white. We were born with enormous privilege, uh, and we have an obligation to listen to everybody who may have different experiences than our own. So uh, looking forward to having the discussion going forward. I, I don't know if we're going to hammer anything out tonight, but um, that, that, that's my sense of what a process could look like in the next few weeks. So thanks. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Go ahead, Jack. And Thank then you. I, I'm unmuted, right? Okay, yes, thank you. Um, I uh, I think we've all been, first off, I thought the event on on Sunday was great. It was one of the biggest crowds I've seen on the State House, and I really appreciate the, uh, the organizers. Um, I think that uh, my experience has been like uh, many others, which is just being inundated with uh, not only information about the uh, the problems, but inundated with ideas about uh, what could be done. And uh, and the other day, you know, there's people may be aware there's this organization called Eight Can't Wait that has been uh, has started out by saying, here are eight changes that pol police departments could uh, could do right now to reduce police violence by 72 percent and i i don't get i don't know where they got those figures but uh, but i went ahead and shared that uh, on my facebook page and one of my first comments from a constituents from his constituent was well are you going to uh, support doing that in montpelier and i uh, reflect reflexively said yes um, uh, the manager informed me that we probably are all doing all of these uh, things, but I'll, I'll read them to people just so they know what uh, uh, changes we're talking about. Ban chokeholds and strangleholds, require de-escalation, require warnings before shooting, exhaust all alternatives before shooting, 
a duty to intervene. That's the duty of other police officers to intervene in unlawful conduct by police officers. Ban shooting at mo moving vehicles. Establish a use of force continuum and require all force to be reported. And uh, I think that this is really barely the start of the conversation. I think uh, we're at an important point with uh, the retirement of Chief Bacos and uh, and the appointment of uh, of Chief Pete. And I, I think that uh, the way I think about it is where we should be now is to start a process of, uh, of community engagement and uh, discussion to consider what Fun, what the needs of our uh, community are, what uh, and what is the appropriate agency to address those needs, and um, I think it's very clear that some of the problems that our uh, society is faced with with are not best addressed by uh, by law enforcement. Um, so, what I would suggest we do. And I'm not making a motion, just proposing as a way to go forward that uh, we start to put some uh, dedicated time into uh, into discussing this once uh, once the new chief is on board. I think since we have appointed him to be uh, our new chief, and uh, in large measure because he. Uh, addresses and embodies the uh, the values that the city is committed to i think we should uh, give him the chance to get on the job before we start before the uh, bus or the boat leaves the leaves the dock and leave him uh, swimming to catch up so, so when the when the new chief's in i think we should start having this discussion thank you jack um, go ahead, Donna, and, and then Lauren, did you want to say something? Okay, we'll go Donna, then Lauren. I mean, if Lauren's first, that's okay. All right. Um, I'm glad that people brought up 21st century policing, and I do feel it isn't that Tony or any police officer is perfect, and we're looking for improvement, but I feel we have to look as a whole community which is why I was so excited about our social justice committee and spending money to bring in an expert to help us as a community to increase our full awareness and to look at our own systemic problems and policies. And that doesn't mean that not to do things with the police, but every department needs to be included. And likewise, when I think of 21st century policing that we all need to be more aware of, is that we also to recognize what we've done in Montpelier with Safe Catch, working with mental health experts, and doing more of that. And I'm surprised to see the police officers in the school was a negative because when it was started, it was to improve community communication with youth. And I, I maybe I only knew the police officer when it was Mark. Uh, I don't know where that is, but I know the intention was to have someone they are to talk to kids and have a relationship, have a face. Now, it would have been better if they weren't in the same uniform, maybe. Uh, but I saw that as a positive, not a negative. So if it needs to be changed how we do that, but I, and maybe not, quote, a police officer, but yet a person looking on a community institution which has a relationship with youth, I think is important. As much as we change institutions, they're still there governing, providing services. So I, I just don't want to lump everything on the police department. I want to look at us all more holistically and more inclusively. And yes, to keep these conversations going because it's a very step-by-step -step process. And I'm glad we're on board to want to making those changes. But I do think it has to be more inclusively owning the problem and changing the problem. Thank you. Great, thanks, Lauren. Yeah, um, I, I mean, in large part, I think a lot of what I wanted to say has already been said, um, but definitely wanted to thank people for coming out and coming with really specific, tangible ideas. As Connor said, it's easy to you know go out to a march, but to actually show up and bring 
really concrete things that we could act on is incredibly helpful and um, and really valuable in trying to move the conversation forward. And I think, you know, all of us, we heard repeatedly, you know, we don't just need nice words, we need action. And I'm totally with you. And I think um, you're hearing that commitment to, you know, continue to work on this and the the resolution and the 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 words were not you know, looked, we weren't trying to, you know, have the conversation end there, but more spur a conversation. So I'm really glad that that um, is happening. I I did want to echo appreciation for um, Chief Fakus, who I really, I have seen, I've been on council for a little over a year, and I feel like the big decisions we've made were the social worker and um, the, the homelessness um, position. And that was a really interesting conversation because it w- really was a recognition. We were debating, is this a position that could be housed at the police department? And I think under the chief's leadership, it was, you know, different people respond differently. And if someone is showing up in a uniform versus um, a street outreach worker with maybe a different training and skill set and a different approach that so that could be viewed differently. And council decided that we would move um, with not a position in the police department. And I think it's the kinds of conversations we need more of and the kind of um, movement that a lot of you are talking about tonight of, you know, what are the services we pro- are providing and who and how should we be providing them? Um, so I think, you know, continuing to look at, you know, what is our, what are we asking of our police and how could those be provided um, in ways that really um, serve the community best? Um, I liked Connor's idea of, you know, and I know um, community members have been bringing this forward of looking at a citizen advisory group. I think that could be a great way to, um, to really dig into, you know, what are our policies around use of force? What are, are we using all of the best available, um, you know, processes, procedures? Um, are there issues that we, you know, need to, to flag and to continue um, that attention? So that could be something that maybe we could do quicker than that and, you know, use it to institutionalize the, the ability to have this ongoing conversation and make sure that we are, um, you know, continuing to, to make progress and do better. And, you know, that could include looking at the budget, you know, what are we spending? Where is that money going? Um, so as a community, we have a better understanding, you know, we can look at 19.9% of our city budget, but you know, what exactly is that? And, and let's, let's all dig in and understand that. Um, and the, I know that the state, um, legislature is looking at some ideas, some of which I know that they're probably not going to get to this year. Often if, cities can do something first, that can be a way to do proof of concept. So we could look at some of those ideas, which are, I think, a little bit different. Some of them are the same that the um, uh, community members have brought, but I think there's a couple um, slightly nuanced, so that could be some other ideas to add to the list. Um, And lastly, I would just say that I know that the um, Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee is very interested in this. And as Donna mentioned, you know, with the commitment that we made to bring in experts at facilitating conversations. I really, um, you know, I think we need a lot of community engagement in how we're, um, you know, developing new ideas and rolling them out and ensure that it's going to work for all kinds of community members. Like the school resource officer, I would love to hear from students. I would love to hear from students of color. What is their experience? You know, what, what are different students? You know, how is that working for for different populations. Um, so I think that that group could also play a role in facilitating community conversations, um, researching policies. Um, so, and I think they would probably be eager to do that. So um, that's my thinking, thanks. Great, thank you. Um, Dan, go ahead. Sure. Um, well, I won't repeat, but I will echo uh, some of the other sentiments that have been expressed. and. I will thank everyone for coming out and having this conversation because it is an important conversation um, to have. Both Jack and Connor, I think, have and and Lauren and Donna have um, really stated a lot of what I intended to do. One thing I think we have to be careful about when we talk about any service, whether it's Department of Public Works, police, fire, dispatch, uh, cemetery, for that matter, is when we have working and functioning and and good portions of the city. Um, and I think there is a lot of the police service that, that fits into that category. If we make changes, do we have unanticipated consequences? And 
you know, in looking at the police budget, you know, we aren't receiving uh, the type of federal, uh, you know, quasi-military hardware that maybe other cities are. Um, you know, a lot of the money seems to go to personnel. Uh, and, you know, if you reduce personnel, it has consequences such as, um, I know that we had issues with under understaffing before that caused mental health stress and strain. Too many people, uh, or too few people trying to do too many things. Um, and if you reduce the size of, of any department, then, you know, you may lose better candidates. Um, not to say that that would occur here, but I think it's something that, you know, is always in the back of my mind when you talk about changing uh, a department. And I think, you know, we've just brought on uh, a new chief, Chief Pete, to um, take over the department. Uh, and one thing I've been struck by the conversations with Chief Pete that he's uh, in all his messages is a willingness to engage in the public. And I really think that that's where a lot of this conversation begins. Um, that, you know, everyone, I echo Connor and to say, you know, please keep coming, please keep raising these issues. Um, but I think Chief Pete is, is the person to talk to in, in the first instance, because it's, it's his department soon. Um, and, you know, when he takes it over, I know he's going to bring a lot of fresh ideas. And I think a lot of what everyone is trying to do is to make Montpelier better, to make it safer, to make ourselves uh, a model for other communities. And I fully support that. And I fully agree with that. Um, and I think that process and, you know, these ideas are not, you know, it's not an antagonistic relationship. A lot of these things are good practices that can be incorporated in, but you know, just merely taking large steps to say that we took a large step can sometimes have the same effect as someone who just simply carries a sign, which is it doesn't have the intended consequence um, and it doesn't have um, the change that we we all want to be on the other side of. So I I support a, a lot of the ideas that have been expressed tonight. Um, but I think that the process uh, really starts with Chief Pete, and I look forward to seeing how he addresses that. I look forward to all of the uh, individuals who came tonight and to continue this conversation, because I think on the other side of it, um, there's improvement to be made. And there's, as somebody said, you know, we, it's hard to imagine a different system when you live within a single system or have forgotten what it was like without that system. And I, I agree with that. Um, and I think that, you know, those changes can can occur, but, you know, changes, real change happens with thoughtful planning. And uh, I think that a lot of this has to go into that, into that network uh, of thoughtful planning. And I look forward to being a part of it. Great. Thank you. Um, Jay. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add quickly that um, I'm uh, appreciative and thankful for all the other counselors' thoughts, and, and I appreciate that we're in we're in, in step together in terms of how to uh, approach this issue from a you know systemic standpoint. I, and I echo all of it, and I won't reiterate it for for <laughs> because um, you know for the sake of time. But the one thing I do I will add is that I think it probably in, in terms of owning the process, it probably makes sense for us to um, reevaluate. Um, the strategic planning that we did. Um, and because, you know, when we put those, the seven priorities together, um, ultimately that sort of created something of a playbook or, or guidance for, for staff to be able to prioritize our, our efforts. And I think given, you know, our conversation and what we've been working on, it might be appropriate to um, not start over by any means, but sort of reevaluate and look at based on where we're at now, and what we're the discussion that we're having is: Do we need to sort of uh, reshift those priorities so that we're, you know, we're uh, giving the appropriate time to to what our priorities are? So I, I just uh, think that that might be an appropriate step in terms of process for the council. Great, thanks. Uh, okay, so um, anyone else have something you want to add? Because I so I have a few. Um, things I want to say here as well. Um, so there have been many suggestions that uh, have come in our direction generally. Some were listed here tonight. Um, we've got 
lots more suggestions um, via email. Uh, Jack mentioned some of them uh, with the eight can't wait, those policies. Um, and, you know, it's going to, it's, uh, <laughs> You know, it would be great to to make decisions tonight, but I, I think that is um, uh, it, this in in order for us to do this well, it's just going to it's going to take uh, a little bit of time, uh, and I think uh, these ideas are worth weighing and worth considering, um, especially you know if if it's a bigger step, it's it's going to uh, take some time to chew on. Um, so, uh, just to to go through a, a few of them. Um, for those of you who suggested uh, uh, removing the uh, school resource officer from the school, um, I, Lauren, I, I appreciated what, what you had to say there. Um, you know, let's talk to um, students, talk to uh, teachers at the school. What has their experience been of having a school resource officer in the building? I know that can have a, a, a narrative nationally, um, is that true for us? It's worth um, having that conversation. And two, if that's still something that people feel strongly should be removed, um, because it's 50% the school board, I'd also encourage people to go to the school board to um, uh, have that conversation because that's that's going to be, a, if, if there's going to be any change there, that's got a joint um, decision and a joint conversation. Um, in terms of policies, uh, with the eight can't wait, uh, those uh, those policies seemed like um, th those would be great changes uh, if if they are changes. Um, and I know the uh, police department was working on publishing their policies, which I I really appreciate. Um, and I think it's either as of today or recently anyway. Um, we've uh, published uh, at least some of the the police's policies. Um, in, on the department's website. Um, I just want to check in um, with Bill and or Tony. Uh, Tony Fagas, do, do you, is, is that list that is published there, is, is, are those all that you're going to publish on the website? No, we're working to get the, uh, all the policies uh, available on the, on the site. Okay, we're great. We're trying to do it with our and vendor, but we're doing it policy by policy, but we just wanted to get the ones that I felt were going to be, you know, critical of impor critical importance right now to this conversation. Okay. So, but we can expect to see more of those up on the website in the near future. Yes. It's in progress. Okay. Great. And, um, I mean, that is, that's something, you know, when I think about like, you know, how have I been, how have I been complicit in all of this? It's, uh, you know, one of the things is like being content to not know, um, what the policies are. So I'm, I'm, you know, this is a, you know, a tiny step, um, just even in knowing what our police policies are. So, um, and then, you know, we can actually take a look at if there's, if there's gaps that need to be filled or adjustments that um, can be made um, there. Um, again, just coming back to the idea that um, these ideas are gonna take some time. Uh, <laughs> Some of you mentioned that like if changes don't happen, we'll be back. And I, I hope that you do come back. Um, and I hope that you, uh, you know, continue to stay engaged in this, um, this process. So um, thank you, thank you for that. And uh, I do hope to see you again as we, you know, continue to work through some of these issues. Um, one of the things I, I just want to reiterate for folks, um, can we just um, have the date out again? What's the date that um, Chief Pete starts? July 1st. July 1st, okay. So, uh, you well, know, it's kind of this funny wait, time wait, period that we're actually, in. To be 100% to be honest, he starts working on June 15 in conjunction with Chief Fay because he will be actually okay. be the chief of the department on July 1st. Got you. Okay. And one of the things that um, came up last time that I think would be um, good <laughs> um, is to have some kind of a, a forum uh, with Chief Pete to um, Stephen just have an informal time of um, you know, discussing some of these ideas or hopes or goals for the department and um, or even just a time to get to know um, our new chief. So um, I, I see he's on the line here. I don't necessarily want to uh, 
you know, ask him to do that. Uh, but, uh, you know, just a heads up that I, I think, um, you know, that that might be a good thing, even if it's remote at that point. And who knows if, um, you know, by July 1st, where, where we'll be. But um, even if, if it's remote, I think that would still be um, useful. Um, so, so there's, there's that. Um, and then um, just, I want to also come back to the idea of, um, of uh, abolishing the police. And I just want to clarify that what I, what I hear there in that idea is, is really about um, when people really talking about re reimagining the police or re envisioning um, what policing looks like. And I think that really gets at, the question of what is the purpose of the police and what is the, um, what's at the heart um, of what, what we need as a community. And uh, I think that is, you know, always a, a good conversation to be having and uh, something that I think we can, um, we can talk through as, um, you know, we look at, uh, you know, the vision and mission of, of the police department. Um, so that's, that's pretty much everything that I, I wanted to say about um, stuff that came up. I guess the, there is, um, you know, people have mentioned the oversight committee. That's very interesting. Um, just in terms of training, I think we could potentially be um, publishing what our, um, the, the kinds of training that our police do go through. Cause we get that question very often uh, as to like, you know, are, are our police officers getting trainings in, um, you know, with mental health or um, with implicit bias and that sort of thing. So um, I think we could be publishing more about that. And um, yeah, so, and even in terms of funding, you know, this, that's, that's something that we can certainly, we can certainly talk about. So uh, but I just as uh, Jack and I think Dan mentioned, um, probably the the most the logical time to have that conversation is when um, uh, once we're starting to transition um, to our, our new chief. So we'll take that up uh, relatively soon. Um, any any other further? I, I know I've just said a whole bunch of things too. Any further thoughts on that? On any of that? Okay, so with, oh, Connor, go ahead. I, I was going to make a motion for a special meeting at some point. That, oh, uh, yes. There, huh? Thank you. Right. Um, before you do that, um, I just want to reiterate that I think we'll, yeah, we, because I would, I would like to um, at least have some plan for um, moving forward. Uh, and so, Let's, uh, are you, are you, how are you all feeling about revisiting some potential changes um, once we have uh, uh, our new chief installed? Um, okay, so uh, I'm seeing a lot of thumbs up and who would actually yeah. like to say something about that? I, um, Lauren and Dan, go ahead. Um, I, I think it makes total sense to have this conversation once chief Pete is, is there. I would just say, like, it doesn't mean there's no work that we can do between now and that meeting. I think there were a lot of really interesting questions raised um, and information gathering, research on some of these ideas to dig in. So just, just to say, it doesn't mean, let's just put everything on hold, but more, let's do some more due diligence, work, research, figure out how we, you know, might engage um, community members in different ways, how the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee could play a role, things like that. So I think those conversations um, and research should continue, um, but yeah. the process um, in a few weeks after with the new chief. Thank you, and Lorna, the, I was um, I was feeling that I was feeling like there was something missing, and I think that's it. Uh, so if there is a point that you, as council, would like to um, bring to the the forefront. Um, Let's be working on those uh, in anticipation of uh, July. Um, okay, okay. Uh, and Dan, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess the only the only point that I and I agree with what Lauren is proposing, uh, which is what I was going to say. Um, the only thing that I would add is that I think you know part of this is Chief Pete's timeline um, because July first is when he's going to officially take over but he may not be ready to have this conversation on July 2nd, um, even though he's done some of the initial work, you know, he may want, excuse me, 
<clears throat> he may want more time, you know, to have some of these community conversations. So, you know, I, I would be loath to put on um, sort of an artificial timeline on this, but at the same time, I mean, I think we, we keep it on our, you know, uh, on our future agenda um, and we, you know, direct Chief Pete or direct the city manager to direct Chief Pete, however we would feel most comfortable about it, um, you know, to start that process to come back to us, um, you know, and understanding that this is this is not a, a year long study, but something that, you know, we do want to have a thoughtful conversation as opposed to a rushed conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Uh, Jay. Well, and I think it's also reasonable for Chief Fakos and Chief Pete to, to recognize that um, part of the transition, pro an important part of the transition process will be community engagement. And so, you, Dan, I agree, not putting a timeline on it necessarily, but understanding how how they can engage with the community to manage the manage this transition process, and then then as you know, Chief Pete takes his response, uh, takes over responsibilities, how he can then sort of process that feedback and continue the feedback loop and then also think about what changes might happen down the road. So, I mean, I think that um, that seems like a, a not, could be, uh, based on our conversations, a natural part of the transition process coming up this month. Great. Okay, thank you all. Um, and Connor, go ahead. Did you want to make a motion? Yeah, no, I think like anything worth doing is worth doing right. And, uh, you know, we want to adhere to open meeting law, which would require some more notice um, than, than just passing an uh, agenda item today. Uh, so with that, I, I, I would make a motion that we have a special meeting, maybe around like noon on Friday, could just hop on the phone. And that would be the official warning um, to close down the portion of State Street in front of the State House lawn there. Uh, for the purposes of painting up Black Lives Matter over the course of that. I, I think um, I see, see Ward Joyce is off the call, but he's already done a on Saturday would probably be enough time to. Uh, Connor, we lost you after um, something about Ward Joyce. Oh, sure. He had a markup, and I, I think he was saying uh, between seven o'clock in the morning and two o'clock in the afternoon would probably be enough time to mark this up. But I'd love a chance for him to talk to Donna Barlow, Casey over at Public Works and maybe huddle in the meantime. And we can nail that down for sure on Friday. Also, Noelle still has access to the Honor Their Names Facebook group. So I told her we probably don't need 5,000 people for the painting like they had last weekend, uh, but pretty confident that she could get a crowd to come out and get it done pretty quick there. So I think that could be a nice community event. I think it's something that we could all have a, a tangible product at the end of the day. And uh, again, I want to reiterate, we recognize the symbolic nature of this and plan on following through with uh, concrete policy ideas. So the motion is to have a special meeting. Uh, I, I could be corrected, but noon on Friday, just over the phone to, to pass this out. Second. Do you want okay. noon? Do you want phone or Zoom in case people want to comment on it? It would need to be Zoom. Is the fact Zoom. we've had to. Um, that's how we've been advertising all of the rest of our meetings, and I think it's an easier way to participate. Oh, that's awesome. Hey, you can't get enough Zoom. That sounds great. Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Jack, and then Donna. Also, is there? There was a second, right? There was a second. Um, okay, Jack and Donna, and then Dan. As we discuss this, I would like to add uh, another item to the uh, to the agenda for this special meeting, which is uh, consistent with it, and that is uh, a resolution to uh, for the city to uh, fly the uh, Black Lives Matter flag at uh, City Hall. Um, is that I don't think we need a motion on that because uh, any counselor can just add something to the, to the agenda, I believe. Um, so I think we're probably good there. Um, unless anyone wants to correct me on that, but I think that's how that works. Um, okay. So Donna. I'm sorry. So 
Are we going to add that to our agenda? I are we going to discuss so. the Black Flag Matter flag now, or are we no, going to that would discuss that on Friday? Wait and discuss that on Friday. Okay, because I'm just a little concerned about how long the meeting on Friday. I have a micro transit advisory group meeting at one. So if you start at 11, maybe we get done. <laughs> it doesn't sound like it's just going to be a vote, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, I'm my. It's tough to say. I would guess it, I don't know, it's tough to say. I would guess that it would probably not be very long. I don't think it would take an hour, um, even if there were comments. Our moderator but. needs to make sure the movie, the, unless you, I'm gonna mute you unless you have been recognized to speak like a normal meeting, please. So if you wanna raise your hand, Colleen, that would be great. And then the mayor can recognize you to speak. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, and also, Donna, if you need to duck out um, early, that's probably fine. Um, Jack. Oh, sorry, I didn't. Uh... Oh, not Jack. I'm sorry, Dan. Yeah, no, I, I, I think 12 noon will be fine. Um, and it, I think, you know, we've had a long discussion about a number of these issues. As I see it, it's really just a matter of finalizing and, and making the approval that we need for the street painting and then the Black Lives Matter flag flying and I think those can both be discrete conversations I'm ha comfortable having both of those on Friday at noon um I also have a one o'clock appointment so we'll try to keep it keep it to then um okay any further discussion oh Jay go ahead sorry this is just getting um silly practical scheduling wise but um in the likely event that uh Main Street Middle School graduation gets canceled tomorrow because of thunderstorms it will begin at noon on friday um and i know dan and i both have children involved and i'm volunteering all afternoon with that so to donna's point about starting at 11 or 11 30 i'd be open to that just, i'm just fine with being very practical here but just sorry yeah that's fine with me um any other thoughts i'm open all day friday don't have okay. a trial it's friday so Anytime we wanted to do it. Okay. And Donna, that's okay for you. Um, 11 30. Dan, that's okay. It'd be better for me. Oh. I, I have a meeting till noon, but I can duck out a little early, but 11 would be tough. <laughs> okay. So 11 30, okay. Okay. Great. 11 30. Great. Super. Um, all right. So we have a motion and a second. I think everyone understands that it's at 11 30. Um, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so we'll have that special meeting then. And then I think um, both uh, our outgoing and incoming chiefs would like to say something. Um, so I think we'll, we'll start with Tony and we'll end with uh, Chief Pete. Go ahead. I just uh, appreciate the, uh, the dialogue and uh, thank everyone. Great. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Brian. Mayor, uh, members of the community, council members, uh, I, I'd like to echo uh, Chief Fakus as well. I do appreciate the dialogue. I'm looking forward uh, to being available for having very honest and robust uh, conversations and I'm um, um, just thankful to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Bill. Yeah, uh, so I just want to say, um, you know, I also appreciate everyone's everyone's uh, comments, and I appreciate the, the events that have happened across the country the last couple of weeks and the last couple hundred years that have precipitated the comments. Um, and and I guess I, I hope that we are thoughtful as we think about why we're going ahead and doing these things here in Montpelier. Um, and I. I you know, we could change some things, but we also, I, I think it is informative that we did a extensive strategic planning effort and we weren't focused on needed change to the police or that we haven't really heard a lot about this. We heard from a dozen or so people, residents of our community today. It would be good to, I think, maybe have a community dialogue um, amongst all people who may have similar or different feelings about 
how we proceed and, and about some of these ideas. Um, I'm going to say, you know, our police department has been uh, excellent, not perfect, but excellent, and in large part due to Chief Vegas. And um, we don't have a hard, large hue and cry here at the city council, by and large, about police concerns. I think that's borne out by things like the protests, not just the one we had on Sunday, which if you think about it was specifically to talk about mistreatment by police of people and our folks handled it as pros uh, perfectly. They kept a low profile out of the way. They helped make sure everything happened. They worked their way with people. I think the, the idea of the social worker came from the police department. Uh, and as Lauren mentioned, was uh, very highly emphasized that it should not be a uniformed police officer. Uh, the same with the school resource officer. I don't know, if, I mean, sometimes they wear their full uniform because they're being coming from another call, but I believe they do try to have them wearing something different. Uh, many of our other protests, I think if you talk to the organizers of, of protests, like the one where they took over State Street with oil derrick, if you talk to the, the level of communication and cooperation with our police department to help those types of uh, civic unrest occur uh, peacefully, and in a way that uh, reflects our community's values. Uh, the 21st century police policing, we were one of the first in the state to champion that and real leaders in the nation. I think people ought to read that. And I, I think many ways it embodies what we're hoping to accomplish here in our, our community. Um, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons Chief Pete was hired was his commitment to those principles, his commitments to community engagement and outreach and hearing from people. And I think that our community is always stronger when we reach out and hear people. Um, but I'm not gonna just sit here and, and nobody said anything bad about our police, I'll be clear, but I don't want anyone to, to leave here thinking that we have such huge problems with our police that they need drastic change. If there's systemic change with racism, by all means, we should be dealing with it. And if there's ways we can improve, improve. you know, one of the reasons our police deal with the uh, some of the things that they deal with is because there's no one else out there. At, in the middle of the night, there are no necessarily mental health workers. There are no drug addiction counselors. There are no other things. So our police department have become social service agencies. And the, by all means, if we can fund more of them or the state can fund more of them, um, we ought to be doing that. We, again, the social worker. So, uh, but Oftentimes at three in the morning, uh, when there's a domestic violence call or anything else, the only two people out there in the entire city to respond to it are our two police officers. Uh, and I'm just, one last thing I'm gonna say about the budget. Uh, I appreciate that, they're, uh, that their budget is 20% of, of, of our operation. So is our fire department and our public works department. I mean, those are our main three services that we provide. Uh, and in fact, when you add in all the equipment and everything else, those, those three things come to about 75% of our budget. That is what local government provides. Uh, I don't think when you look at the police scene in our budget compared to other communities, you're gonna find that it's outsized or oversized or anything else. Can we spend it better? Sure. So I guess I'm gonna be the, the, the guy that sticks up for our, our folks and I'm proud to do it because they're a great department. Great. Thank you, Bill. Um, okay, so looking forward um, at this evening's agenda, um, we have about an hour and a half before I would like to be done, um, which means um, I think we're going to uh, actually push off the, the lobbying committee, and I see that Alec Ellsworth is still on the call, and I think we should probably, unfortunately, punt um, the Chapter 13 to another day. Um, if, if I uh, may, there on those two yes. things. Yes. The lobbying committee is really only just to appoint three members. Yeah. It's not, it, and then let them figure out what they okay. want to do. Hopefully that will be right. And on chapter 13, I believe we made all the decisions at the last meeting and we just asked for it to come back finally drafted to be approved so that everyone could read it. So okay. it's possible so it won't take very long. Okay. Well, fair enough. So, what I would really like to do though is take a break. Yes. Um, <laughs> and um, when we, how about this? When we come back from the break, we'll do the lobbying committee and then we'll do chapter 13. And then hopefully those will be, hopefully those will be fast. And then um, we can move on um, from there. Does that sound okay, team? 
Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so we're going to try to keep this to a five minute break. So I'm going to try to be back here at 841. So specific. Okay. See you all soon. All right. Well, we'll come back from our break then. Um, let's take up the, the lobbying committee first. Uh, Connor, do you want to talk about that? I think we talked about it quite a bit. I, I just think, uh, uh, you know, I'll reiterate, um, I think it's a good idea to have our thumb on the pulse of what's happened in the state house uh, because there are always opportunities to pull down money, uh, opportunities to collaborate with other municipalities. And anytime there's just an agenda item like, again, homelessness task force, we could send our members there. Um, I, I think we're in a good position just being in close, close proximity to the state house. Uh, that we can have a bit of a presence there. So if there's uh, three people, I would certainly volunteer to be one of the three. So we're mostly just appointing three people. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so Connor, you're interested. Anyone else interested? Lauren, is there anyone else? Oh, Dan, great. Um, anyone else? Okay, I think we probably need a motion. District. Yeah, that's right. We planned it that way, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so is, uh, is there a motion to uh, appoint these three to the uh, lobbying committee? So I'll move. make the motion. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. Thank you, you three. Very appreciative of that. Um, do we think chapter 13 will be relatively short? Let's I, work. I, that's my hypothesis. Okay, so um, let's take up chapter 13. It has been um, revised and re-revised. So, um, I'm going to open a public hearing on the amendments to Chapter 13 of the Ordinances, uh, Natural Resources uh, Chapter. Any comments on the changes? I, I, uh, like, the, I like the changes, and I really appreciate what the Park Commission brought forward for our, our consideration. And okay. Great. Make a motion uh, next time you want one. Okay, um, Connor, did I see you at, oh, and then Jack, Connor, then Jack. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate all the work that went into this. Um, I still have a little discomfort. I think I would prefer the smoking ban uh, across Hubbard Park, just because it's the biggest piece of public property uh, we have in the city, would be, you know, sort of shelters or trails or something like that, and not, you know, park-wide. Uh, so I, I, I might actually uh, vote against this, but it's not because there isn't good work in every other piece there. Um, and I, I really appreciate it. So that's all I'll say on that. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jack. Thank you. I, I hope I wasn't uh, reading the wrong thing by accident, but I think that as I reviewed this uh, for tonight's meeting, there are still some, uh, seem to be some spots where there are some stray matter. If we go to uh, section 13-319, there is still there's still one place where my name appears in the text and one where Dan's appears in, in the text. Really? Unless I'm looking at the wrong thing. I don't see that. I don't see that. What number is that, Jack? You, you know, Jack, you may be looking at the redlined version and the other, there was another version that was not redlined and I think had those changes removed. Okay, yeah. let me... Let me just see. Well, we can just make sure staff removes them. Yeah, they're not. I, I hate to. I hate to be that person, but um, if you look at the non. -red you are line, correct. You're yeah. correct. Never mind. Okay. Great. Yeah, okay. I'm happy. I'm okay. happy to put my name back in if that. Was <laughs> Dan Richardson Memorial Ordinance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, Donna, go ahead. So can I make that motion, yes. Mayor? Yes. I make a motion that we accept this final amendment of Chapter 13 of Ordinances as presented for its third reading. Second. Second. Okay. Um, any comments? This is a public hearing, so um, any comments from the public? 
And Cameron, do you, any word from you? Okay. All right. Um, so we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No, but I love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, best dissenting vote I've heard in a long time. Okay. Um, all right. So that motion carries and I think we are moving on then. Um, let's go to the coronavirus, uh, update. Um, hey, I, over, um I think it's yes. And before I do that, I just want to check with John, cause I, I do believe that if there is any dissenting votes, you have to do a roll call because we're technically remote. And I just want to make sure that we do that so that that is valid and binding. Well, that's the ah. old rules. I'm not sure what the new rules are. Um, I think that I, still stands. Does it still stand? I actually wasn't sure about that. I thought it was sort of free for all meeting now with in Zoom <laughs> land. No, I thought um, it still stood too, John. And well, then should do it just in case, I suppose. Sounds just fine. Um, all right. So. Um, regarding Honor, that, you don't want to reconsider. <laughs> it's okay. So, um, okay, so we're going to revisit that previous. Do it by roll. Call your name. Uh, uh, Dan. Oh, yes. I'm not sure who you called on. You, I got a bubble. Okay. Yeah, Okay. All right. Well, let's, we'll try this again. Um, actually, I'm going to go in the order around the horseshoe, just so you know what to expect. Uh, okay. So I'm going to start with Donna. Aye. Um, Connor. Nay. Jay. Aye. Dan. Aye. Jack. Aye. Lauren. Aye. Okay. So thank you. So the motion passes. Um, so now we're on to the COVID-19 update and Cameron. All right, thank you. I'm gonna breeze right through this memo that I sent out and for the public's awareness, it is on uh, the website under the agenda materials for today, um, if you wanna look at it. Um, we did have some state updates um, since your last regular meeting. Uh, on June 1st, the governor announced that the DMV has a restart plan and will be offering driver's license exams starting on the 8th, which is two days ago. Um, our Montpelier office is open um, from 8 to 4 for driver's exams only by appointment. So you have to call them and make an appointment if you want a driver's exam. On June 2nd, um, Governor Phil Scott signed a new executive order to form the Racial Equity Task Force um, as a component of a broader state effort to promote racial, ethnic, and cultural equity, including its response to COVID-19. On June 5th, the governor announced an addendum 17 to the COVID executive order, which modified quarantine restrictions on travelers arriving in Vermont and municipal regulation of bars and restaurants. So starting June 8th, two days ago, restaurants will have been able to begin limited indoor dining um, which allows for 25% capacity limits with six feet between folks. Uh, bars seating is still closed. There's also new cleaning standards for restaurants. Um, this also does allow local municipalities to uh, restaurants if there is a pressing health need. Um, the amended travel policies um, effective this Monday um, had interstate travel to and from New England uh, areas and New York counties that have few, fewer than 400 active COVID-19 cases per million was permitted without a quarantine requirement. In addition, starting in five days, travelers may com complete quarantine requirements in their home state before entering Vermont. So that means if they quarantine in their home state, they wouldn't have to quarantine here. Um, the governor also um, updated us on June 5th about an, a new outbreak in Winooski which they consider a official community outbreak. Um, the health department is working to keep that contained. Uh, they did provide us another update on that on June 9th. Um, and the outbreak has now been known to include people in the neighboring Burlington area. Um, there are test sites, and this is a good time to remind folks about those. Um, test sites can be found at uh, Vermont's Human Resources 
uh, department page at humanresources.vermont.gov slash pop-ups. Or you can also figure out where the testing sites are by calling 211. The governor and Dr. Levine have also um, encouraged folks who have been out protesting and in large groups to get testing um, to ensure that you're not spreading the illness unknowingly. Um, know that you can be uh, infected with COVID-19 and not have symptoms. Um, his update today included a outbreak update. Um, there are now 74 total cases associated with the Winooski outbreak. But he did have some exciting news. He announced that he is planning on opening the schools in fall for in-person instruction. And they reviewed what that phase plan would look like. And then the exciting part of all of this is that the Lewis McClure Foundation, sorry, announced that they have a gift for the high school graduating class of 2020. And that every single member of the class of 2020 from all Vermont high schools will receive one free course of their choosing from uh, Community College of Vermont this fall. Uh, with all the expenses paid via that foundation. So that was a pretty uplifting announcement and a really great one for um, education. So our general city updates and what we've been doing, a lot of it is recreation related, um, interesting update. Um, city uh, Summer Capital Kids Day Camp will is moving forward for summer 2020. Um, we created an operations plan to ensure compliance with state regulations on camps and that information is being shared with those registering for camp. Um, the ACCD issued new guidance for organized sports. So starting June 15th, so in five days, interest squad activities and practices can begin. So group numbers have to be under 25, um, but the recreation dep uh, department has changed its rental policy to accommodate that. Um, so we are opening our fields for rentals if people fit certain guidelines, including um, providing their own cleaning and disinfectant supplies if they need it, and um, making sure they understand that they are not allowed to have actual games. They're basically just being able to play scrimmages against each other, and they need to keep their group sizes under 25. The rules are also pretty clear um, about what types of sports you can play. Uh, they made it very clear that things like high contact sports like football are not allowed. We're also reopening pavilion rentals. Um, that information will be shared and hopefully updated this week on our website. Um, there will be stipulations and understanding that it's basically at residence risk. We still do not have staff available to clean those. We weren't like disinfecting them to begin with. It's not a reduction in service. It's just letting people know that that space is an outdoor space and they can use it. Um, so we are working on opening that back up. And the city has finalized its phase one reopening plan and that is for you to look at today as well. I did make in the memo a note of your mask ordinance that went into effect June 4th. Our regional aid group updates is pretty much the same as it was last time. Not a lot has um, changed. We have still been in regular communication with the CAN uh, groups and um, representatives from uh, Thrive and other area groups. Um, I don't have any other news to share from them right now. Um, as an update for our communications, we have had an uptick in viewers and residents reached. All of our COVID related posts since our last update have received on average about 1,450 interactions, which is way better than we have been doing before. So people really are turning to the city for information and um, understands what like what sources we're using to spread information. And as an aside, uh, our announcement regarding the hiring of incoming police chief Brian Pete reached um, almost 10,000 people on Facebook, which is our most popular post ever. So that's, that was pretty exciting. And that is my update for this meeting. Super, thank you. Any questions about that? Jack. I just wanted to note for thank thank you for the update, Cameron. I just wanted to note for whoever's still at the meeting or uh, or who's watching at home, with regard to the governor's uh, advisory panel on racial equity, applications for uh, membership on that panel are due by the close of business uh, this Friday, June twelfth. So I know that. There's, there's likely to be a lot of uh, interest in this panel, but if anyone is interested in applying 
uh, the site is racialequity.vermont.gov. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Jay. Yeah, now seems um, as good a time as any when we're talking about the uh, uh, mask requirement, just to mention that um, uh, I brought this up a couple of meetings ago that I was concerned that if we were going to require masks in the city, that that might be, uh, be have a, uh, an impact on, on some local businesses and also some populations that might not necessarily have access to readily access to, to, to masks. And so um, uh, last earlier this week, I reached out to the folks at the Hunger Mountain Co-op because they have been uh, offering Mass to um, requiring masks for a long time, but uh, earlier than even you know before before the city required them, um, but offering them and and they agreed to buy uh, uh, to to purchase masks uh, at cost for the city, um, and so I, I spoke with Bill about it, and we um, we should have about a thousand masks coming early next week um, that we can make available to. Um, to business owners and to other uh, populations that may, like I said, may not uh, have easy access to them so that they can um, shop safely and, and access stores. Um, and it was a pretty small impact, uh, budget impact, and uh, thankful to, to the co-op for helping with that. And, and I'll be working with Bill and uh, potentially uh, Dan Groberg at Montpelier Live to figure out how we can make those available to folks. Great, thank you so much for working on that, Jay. Anyone else? Okay, so I uh, managed to skip uh, an item, so we're gonna go back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so we're gonna go back to uh, the Parklet uh, Ordinance and all that is that. So um, I think for this, this over to, to Bill. I mean, I think that makes sense. Sure. Um, yeah. unless, well, you, well, that's fine. Unless you want to do the reopening plan and finish up the COVID stuff, but no, 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 no. Sorry, well, there probably yeah, are people no. on for this. So I, I don't know yeah. how much more I have to add at, at the meeting we had last time. Uh, the council laid out some general parameters. So what uh, we were asked to do was prepare an ordinance or some sort of direction on parklets. So as you can see, basically, created a, a replacement section, a temporary uh, suspension of, of a, most of the ordinance with a, a new section to be in effect until October 25, and to lay out um, the terms under which we would have parklets. Uh, and I, I think it's consistent with everything we talked about. I ran all of this through Dan Grober, who I can see is on, and I believe we are in sync on this. Dan, tell me if I'm wrong. And then uh, the other question I was directed to look at was to create options for, uh, to, to lay out some options for Langdon Street and some pros and cons. And obviously we had a site visit last week. And um, so uh, basically laid out five things we could do. And, and my recommendation, which again, I believe is uh, consistent with Dan's recommendation, but he can speak for himself. So, Happy to go through it all in detail, but I think it's we've talked about it quite a bit at our meetings. Okay. Uh, so I think we should probably take this to um, one piece at a time. Um, let's maybe talk about the parklet piece first, and then we'll talk about Langdon Street. Um, any comments, particularly your questions about uh, the amendments? And it is an ordinance you'd want to open a public hearing at some point. <laughs> By the way, I don't think I ever closed the previous, uh, the chapter 13 uh, ordinance or uh, amendment public hearing. And so I'm going to open the public hearing now for um, the parklet uh, amendments. And Jack, go ahead. Thank you. Um, this is uh, an informational question, which I, I tried to resolve by looking at the city parking map and I just want to be sure, given that, uh, are, are there any uh, designated handicapped parking spaces on the streets in the area that are covered by uh, by the ordinance? 
I didn't see any looking at the map. I don't think there are, and I, and we intended to uh, to leave to make sure that they were excluded. Um, let me just take a look here and see if that actually made it into my I, I believe record. that's in the manager's discretion to exclude spaces for curbside pickup, handicap accessibility, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I, I, and I would want us to specifically provide that if there are any hand, hand up spaces that they would not uh, be available for Absolutely. the parklet. And I don't know if we have to put that in the ordinance or just understand that that's the way you would uh, exercise yeah, your discretion. That was kind of writing that was if, if it's an accessible space, then it's off limits. Okay, great. Yeah, that's in there. Um, under H, yeah, so as an EDA conflict. Um, great question, though. Um, any further comments or questions about the amended parklet? Uh, Dan, um, yeah, I'll just I think this looks good. I am, I'm happy with it. It captures what we intended, which is to sort of loosen and liberalize the parklet policy for this period of time. So, you know, I, I would support it going forward, um, especially because I think time is of the essence given where we're at in the season and its purpose. Um, and it will be, uh, you know, I think we let we get this passed as quickly as possible so that businesses can take advantage of it. I agree. Oh. Any comments? Cameron, are you? We're having a hard time hearing you, Mayor. Oh. oh. Um. Well, any anyone um, on your radar wants to speak? Oh no, can you hear me? Yes, Bill. Do you have anything you want to add? No, I'm good. I think we've covered it on that. Okay. Um, is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the parklet ordinance um, as presented. I'll second it. Great. Further discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So we have that. Um, uh, on that. Um, and do we need us? Sort of a formality. Um, so we don't technically need a second reading your recommendation there bill so we don't our, our um charter just says the council can adopt an ordinance uh after holding a hearing our pro you know long-standing practice has been to hold a second reading um but it isn't required and so i think if you if uh you know we want to get this out fast um you can just consider it approved tonight or you could hold a second reading on the 24th. There'd just be two more weeks before people could could do it. Or, oh, you, could hold, or you could hold a second reading on Friday. So that I was going to say, yeah, we need two days if we want to <laughs> continue tradition and not hold it up too much. Yeah. Uh, Donna. Well, but the other thing is, unlike our other ordinances, we didn't post this as a first reading. So it's not like the expectation was set up. But Friday's fine. Friday's fine. Okay. Well, let's, so we'll add it to the agenda Friday just for good measure. Um, <coughs> that makes sense to me. Um, okay. Uh, so I think we're, we're going to consider that done. Um, so discussion about Langdon Street. Um, what are your thoughts, Council? What would you like to do regarding Langdon Street? Can I just say, uh, we have Brad and Melissa who are 
business owners on Langdon Street, and I, I think they were having trouble getting in. I just I just got a text from them. So I'm not I'm not oh. sure what the issue is. Huh? We might have to keep on going, but they're they're trying anyways. Well, would you like to? For uh, we could um, move on to a different topic and come back to this. I think it might be worth it because it it does impact them pretty directly there. So yeah. Okay. All right. Well, in that case, Connor, I'm sorry. Uh, Brad and who was the other one, Connor? Oh, Melissa from Sweet Melissa. Melissa. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I just want to make okay. sure I out for their names. So, we'll uh, we'll uh, assuming that they would like to be present for that. We'll back to it. So let's jump now to the summer schedule and we'll come back to the Langdon Street conversation. Um, so summer schedule, is that in also Cameron? Um, or maybe- Well, summer schedule could be either of us. Uh, I mean, this is really your call. It's typically in the past, we have eliminated one council meeting during the summer. Um, Usually, typically in August, although it doesn't have to be. And I believe our cover sheet just lists the current. Um, so currently we're scheduled for July 8, July 22, August 12, and August 26, not counting any special meetings. So really the question is, is did you want to just keep that schedule? Do you want to eliminate one? Obviously, we've always reserved the right to a special meeting if we had a contract or something that needed to be approved but um I don't know, it's 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 just good to decide it early for planning for agenda items and scheduling and that sort of thing sorry so we usually skip at least one of those meetings is we that what you're skip saying one meeting in the summer um okay. just because people are away and that, yeah but again this is an odd summer i don't know how much people are going to be traveling and those kinds of things so it's really it's up to you, but normally it's, it's often been the first August meeting, not always, but often. Well, that would be definitively my preference. Um, but yeah, I bet um, it would. <laughs> I'm getting married on July 25th. So I'm hoping to be gone that next week. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, Jack. I, <laughs> I don't feel as much pressure to cancel a meeting this summer because I think we're mostly going to be in Montpelier. Uh, but how about we take August uh, and meet once on the 19th so that it's sort of in the middle of the two meetings in case uh, something comes up. But I'm, I'm happy to do anything to uh, any of those uh, weeks. That would be yes. fine with me as well. Point out that I, you all have a meeting with me. That's also perfectly fine. Um, uh, thoughts or opinions? Uh, is that me, Anne? Like, yes. Know. Sorry, Lauren. I think my internet. Is <laughs> uh, no, I would. I would just know that there's, depending on how everything's playing out, there's a chance I would miss a second July meeting, but. You all can go on without me as well, if that's um, but just in case other people had similar conflicts. Dan. But it, it seems given that, that the 2nd July meeting has um, two conflicts. And I would suggest that we, um, that we pick that one, um, given especially that the other, uh, the rest of us, I. I certainly don't foresee any type of vacation this summer. Um, so I don't have a problem meeting in August and uh, two times and giving up one week in July uh, for call it a mayor's holiday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Work for me as well. If we the last meeting in July and then, Jack, you were saying let's push the first meeting in August back is that what you're saying? I, I think, but I was assuming that it would be the only meeting in August. But, uh, okay. Well, either either way. <laughs> either way works. Whatever works best for you and your bliss is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's all good. Um, okay. Other thoughts on this? 
Donna, Connor, Jay. No. Oh. I'm I'm fine with Dan's suggestion of if we wanted to eliminate the July 22nd meeting and go from there. It sounds like if there's a couple conflicts, that's fine with me. Okay. Um, if we don't have a meeting on July 22nd, um, but we do have a meeting on August 5th, I will probably still also not be at the August 5th meeting. Um, but that's okay. Donna can lead it. Um, but I would also appreciate the one before the wedding off as well. So, <laughs> so either way, it doesn't matter to me. No, you're wrong. It's the second is August 12th. Right. August yeah. 12th. Oh, you're going to get back. Oh, I'll be back. I'll be back. It's, it's fine. fine. Okay. It's fine. So we'll be on. We'll be July eight, August twelve, and August twenty six. Got you. Thank you. So I'm good. Perfect. Okay. So so we're gonna take yeah. off the twenty second. All right. Got it. Thank you. Perfect. Sorry for the confusion. Okay. No problem. And I don't think we need a motion about that. Right. I don't. I don't think no. we do. You don't usually do what I don't um, think. What, what do you think, Jack? Do you think we should? No, I don't think we need to. Okay. okay. As long as we all agree. Okay. All right. Um, and uh, Connor, were you seeing uh, Brad and or Melissa on? No, do we know if they're still? Do we know if they're still trying to get in? I'll um, I'll give her a ring. Actually, hold on. Okay. Um. While you are getting in touch there, um, uh, oh, we didn't actually cover the reopening plan. Is that right? right. Okay. Right. So, okay. So let's let's talk about the reopening plan. Okay. Sorry, we were jumping around a little here a little bit. I apologize. So um, this was amended. Um, you talked a little bit about this uh, last time and I took your um, discussion to heart and I've had some further discussion with staff on how to um, best reopen some of our facilities and services. Um, so this is still subject to change depending on what the governor does, but I did want to give you a general idea of what um, the city is thinking just to keep you obviously in the loop of what we're doing and how we intend on um, moving through reopening and want your approval really on how we plan on opening because this needs to be sort of a community engagement process because we're really what we're doing is re-engaging our community so um, the opening plan goes through a situation overview which really talks about what the virus is how we've been uh, maintaining our essential services and then discuss uh, a bit about the financial strain of the coronavirus impacts um, we discussed how we've put about a third of our staff on voluntary furlough. Um, we have been discussing, and you will hear later in um, Kelly's budget presentation, sort of how we plan on starting to bring those folks back. But that really does have a huge um, service impact um, to what we can do in direct services. So um, making sure that we're um, letting people know that many city services will still be limited accepting those that respond to public health and safety, which have been continuing as normal, um, just because some of our employees will not be back until the end of July. So some of these things, their timelines may shift from the beginning to the end of July, but that's really the only, the flexibility within this plan. So we understand that the general considerations is that the primary spread concern for COVID-19 is through respiratory transmission. So our primary focus has been um, preventing atmospheric spread. So we've changed some of the ways that we're going to be letting people in and out of our buildings. Um, and we're really still trying to provide services that do not require face-to-face -face interaction to protect our staff and residents. And we really do encourage digital communications and people using our drop boxes whenever is possible. We will be requiring appointments for all in-person meetings inside the city facilities. We will require social distancing and the wearing of masks within city facilities and will continue to use telework when possible if it's not disruptive to operations. Um, those decisions will be made by city departments individually, whatever best supports their um, operations. But we will still be trying to give our staff as much opportunity as possible to work from home since that is the governor's um, suggestion. So I split the plan outside of those two general concepts 
into facilities changes and our um, services change. Um, if you give me a second, the print version that I was given is not complete. So I need to pull up the actual version that I'm wanting to read. Hold on a second, I'm sorry. No worries at all. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. So now I'm gonna be looking at my computer screen and not you, I apologize. So our facilities updates um, really are um, pretty specific to each facility building and what those um, each building will be able to handle. So going about facilities and how we're gonna be opening our building in City Hall at 39 Main Street, we'll be still continuing limited public access and opening the building only on Tuesdays and Thursdays to the public. So that means any appointments that people want to make will be need to make on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We'll be opening our bathrooms on a limited basis on Tuesdays and Thursdays when the buildings are open. The upstairs bathrooms, the ones on the floor where a lot of the offices are, um, will be reserved for employees only. And our basement bathrooms, which will are closest to the back of the building um, through that entrance, um, Masks will be required for public access, and we will be providing those masks to folks who have appointments and business inside City Hall based on mask availability. Um, we're discouraging in-person meetings. Currently, the limit is 25 folks in one space that allows for six feet between participants. So that really limits some of our um, availability to meet. Um, we will be asking that people meet in our conference rooms and not in their offices. Um, we also, um, I say this later, but we have been putting up those plexiglass barriers for most of our point-to-point um, -point contacts, um, such as um, our office attendants and people who really serve the public one-on-one -on -one and we knew we're gonna be hot spots. we put in those um, uh, dividers. The fire department will remain close to the public. It will accept walk-ups for health-related issues. Fremont Cemetery is still open, but the buildings are closed to the public. Our police department remains closed to the public, as does our senior activity center. Our recreation center, our indoor facility, will remain closed to the public for now until we have enough staff brought back to be able to clean it. And programming and reservations are currently canceled for our rec center. Regarding our outdoor parks and recreation facilities, the parks are open to the public. Um, the playgrounds are closed and the city playgrounds that we have authority over are behind the pool at one poolside drive and directly behind the sen senior center at 58 Barry. The pool is closed. Um, we did amend this today, but it was um, at like a four o'clock meeting. So this will change after this um, reading is we are accepting limited field reservations and outdoor facilities, shelter rentals. Um, so that will be updated. Like I said, this really does need to be a uh, living document. Can um, we put one in for July 25th? Yeah. Uh, being honored, Mayor. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Currently, our programming and events are canceled pending any further decisions by the state. And um, our fields, courts, um, and skate park are open on a limited basis. It's basically use at your own risk, and those are all tied to the governor's safety guidelines. Our Department of Public Work facilities still remain closed to the public. Um, we're also going to be implementing a pickup drop-off location in City Hall. You all have been here many times, so you will have seen the big desk that sits next to the stairs that go downstairs. We'll be making that desk into a pickup drop-off location where most of our common forms can be found so people can walk in, take a form, and leave without having to interact with anyone. Um, we will also be placing markers on the floors with or tape of some variety um, that is safe for the floors um, in some of our heavily trafficked areas to indicate where folks should stand if they're waiting um, and uh, have directionals in and out so folks know um, to stay six feet apart. Um, we'll also be placing signs and markers throughout City Hall uh, saying what areas are open to the public and which remain closed. 
we'll be making sure that you can see our hand sanitizer stations that are all over the building. Um, and we'll be putting directional signs for those. Um, so starting again, just starting July 1st, we will be opening City Hall for Tuesdays and Thursdays with y'all's approval and the upstairs bathrooms will be reserved for employee use only. Um, so City Hall downstairs where our public works departments are and our planning departments will remain locked. Um, those are by appointment only and we're trying to keep um, our facilities as um, we're able to clean them as, as much as possible. So limiting places where people can wander is the, we think the best way to address that. So I'm gonna pause there and see if anyone has any just general facilities questions before I go into some of our service changes. Okay. Yeah. I, I might have read this or I might not have seen, seen this, but uh, our, are we doing something in city hall where it's the front door goes in and the back door goes out or something like that. So it's one way in and out of the building. Um, I considered that, um, that is, uh, one of the ways we can have best practices, but that really does limit our ADA accessibility. Um, so folks who need to leave and come out that one door that would really limit that. So we're just trying to hope that, um, you know, we will put signs up that say, please socially distance one person out the door at a time. Um, but I don't think it would be fair to, to do that or safe to do that, honestly. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, Jay? Not a question, but just a really quick comment in that I think it, it, it's worth mentioning to folks to remember that um, uh, a lot of the more high, the the larger and more high profile playgrounds in the city are managed by the by the school district and not not the city. Um, I, I've had some questions from constituents. Uh, hey, are playgrounds opening? Um, and you've, we've got two different decision making bodies around those. And so ultimately, the school district is adhering to what the agency of education directs them in terms of opening school grounds. Um, and as far as they know, they're planning on playgrounds. Um, being closed through the summer until the schools open back up in the fall. But I just think it's an important distinction if, if people have questions. Um, it, it's not a city decision for like the Union Elementary School playground to open or the basketball court at the middle school, et cetera. So. It's, that's interesting. And I, and thank you for bringing that up because I, I, I recall our previous discussion about how the city owned playgrounds are also going to be closed through the summer and that, continues to be true or not so much? Yes, uh, they are closed right now. We are getting our guidance, rec departments are getting their guidance from the ACCD. Um, and right now they have advised that those should remain closed. And I've had a lot of um, citizen comments about that. And I do want to sort of address is that we have not been directed to um, disinfect those. There's no um, cleaning uh, protocol for playgrounds. We don't have staff to do that. They're not being maintained and we can't really condone opening something that would um, allow children to touch them and then potentially spread that to other children. So we can't really condone that activity. So um, we have been advised by the state to keep those closed for now. And if that changes or the government or the governor makes any changes to that, we will let you know. But right now we're being told to close those. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay. All right, um, I'm gonna dive right into the service limitations. Sorry, this is a long document. Um, so the assessor's office, we just wanna make sure everyone is on the same page about what we're offering, but the assessor's office is going to be in person by meetings by appointment only. City council, um, your meetings will remain via Zoom or other online pro platform to encourage social distancing. Um, the Act 92 that allows us to do this um, will be out of effect when the state of emergency lifts. And we'll have to revisit that because what that will mean is that we can still have Zoom meetings, but someone will have to be in the city council room um, in person, like a staff member will need to be in there if anyone um, wants to participate that way. So if the state of emergency ends, we will set up our own um, Zoom station, if you will, for public comment. And um, I'll be in there uh, to make sure that um, people can be uh, participating via Zoom 
through the city council hall while still remaining six feet apart. So um, that is not in place now. Um, that depends entirely on when the state of emergency ends. So the city manager's office is still requiring appointments. Um, again, our meet building will be open for meetings on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Masks will be required. Um, In-person meetings are still discouraged and all meetings will be taking place in large conference rooms to promote proper social distancing. And we do encourage remote services. The clerk's office will again have limited public access um, appointments only for land record searches. There will be no more than two researchers at a time. The office will be available Tuesdays and Thursdays from eight to four and sets of two two hour time slots. These appointments can be made by request on a case by case basis before July one. And the clerk has provided a um, Google uh, sign up sheet. Um, John, I'm, it's also on your website, correct? Uh, it's not on my website currently because I have been managing access in a little okay. bit of a hands-on way, but it should okay. be soon. Okay, thank you. And the clerk's office will be beginning to promote uh, election participation by mail for August 2020 elections. Polling places will be minimally staffed as it stands now. The Community Justice Center will continue to um, provide remote services. In-person intake services may be allowed on a case-by-case -case basis with physical state space permitting by appointment. Finance is also encouraging remote services and will be holding meetings by appointment only. Um, the fire department, uh, the facilities remain closed to the public, but walk-ups for health-related issues are accepted. They will be responding to calls for service as normal, uh, but fire prevention activities within our area schools are still on hold. Greenmount Cemetery is maintaining their current service levels. The police department is responding to calls for service as normal, but their facilities are still closed. The senior activity center has no changes plans to um, the closure of their classes until the state of Vermont advises on reopening specifically for senior centers. Um, and I do know that Jana Claire, our director for our senior center is working with the adult services division, Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living to kind of come up with a cohesive plan for all senior centers across the state so that it can be a coordinated effort. Um, the rec center indoors is still closed. Our programming is canceled. Department Works is still asking people to have remote services and will be doing meetings by appointment only. Um, I included a rec link for sign up for vacation day camp, um, but otherwise right now, most of our other programs are canceled as we sort of reviewed earlier. And planning is doing remote services and in-person meetings by appointment only. Inspection services or health officer services will be appointed appointment only as well if safety guidelines can be upheld. So further in the um, memo, I explain again that Act 92 may expire and council meetings will maybe need to be um, both in a physical space and on Zoom but we really do um, encourage that meetings are still held remotely since we are seeing other outbreaks in Vermont and we would like to hold as many um, remote meetings as possible. So our advisory towards council committees, advisory boards and task forces is that they should be able to resume their normal schedule when staff starts returning from furlough and we'll need to establish through their staff representative what their schedule will be. Uh, we encourage them to remain remote in their meetings through phone or online meeting platforms until further notice. Uh, City Hall only has one conference room that can accommodate um, every all of our committees in a socially distanced way. And so we need to make sure that we can um, work with the staff representative to schedule those appropriately. We also have been talking to our partner agencies in City Hall that includes the Lost Nation Theater and the Teen Center. Um, those agencies both need to follow their ACCD guidelines and the other state guidelines. And that does take into account the 25% capacity um, that we have to have here in City Hall it has to be lower than that. And no more than 25 people can congregate in those locations. So we will be keeping them up to date and they are keeping us up to date about what guidance they have. Um, 
And then I listed what our internal city policies and procedures that we have created um, around COVID are and what we are being, um, what we are holding our employees to, to keep their workspace and um, other employees and residents safe. So I know that was a lot, but does anyone have any questions? We are looking for approval for this plan because we just wanted to. Right. Okay. I'm not seeing any other comments or um, if there's no comments or questions, uh, go ahead, Jack. Thank you. I'm not sure if this is the time to to raise this or if it uh, should wait until the uh, until the budget update. But I do have a concern about the. Uh, discussion of the date of work of return to work for furloughed employees and I recognize that uh, this phase one plan doesn't say anything specific about the uh, what date they're returning so I, I just want to flag that yeah we'll we'll save that for the our conversation with the budget um, Donna do you have something I thought it said either July 1st or July 31st. Yeah, we're, we'll, we're actually going to go through this in the budget. Some are coming back on the 1st and some on August 1st. And if we change it, then they'll have to change that. As Cameron said before, it's a living document. So, yeah. I, I appreciate all the details. Thank you very much, Cameron. Well, with that, hey, I, there, I move and we approve it. Is there a second? Okay, we got a motion and a second. Um, any further conversation about uh, the reopening plan? Okay, not seeing anybody. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, all right, so that is approved. Thank you so much. Um, so I think at this point, again, I apologize that we're jumping around here a little bit, but uh, going back to the conversation about um, Langdon Street. Um, all right, so looking at uh, all the possibilities there, um, and I, I don't know if um, Brad or Melissa were able to join us, but- um, I do have, um, I, I have notes that they've sent, so I, I can read them. Okay. Um, before we get to the um, council conversation on that, so any member of the public that would like to speak about um, what uh, the, the possibilities are for Langdon Streets? And are you seeing anyone? Okay, just wanted to check. Um, all right, so. Um, yeah, uh, but Connor, you have some comments from Brad and Melissa. Yeah, uh, and both of them are, I'm forgetting what option it is. Both of them really support the closed Langdon Street halfway measure. Um, they're really worried about the parklets that they don't think, and especially where Melissa is situated, that it would work distance wise for. And I, I did get permission to read this. Uh, with Brad, he says, with only 25% occupancy, that only gives them 12 people in the tavern if they want to reopen. Um, and he can't really justify that. They would need more sitting. Um, but to rehire the employees, they can't be doing the 25%. Uh, so but, but anyways, I, I can sum up, both those businesses would be really eager to have the um, four tables each if they could with the 10 feet apart there. Um, Brad's told me they're losing ten thousand dollars, you know, a month with Langdon Street Tavern. So for the viability of both of them, um, it would be a real boost to be able to get some tables out there. And in a socially distanced way. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, comments from council. What are, what are your thoughts, uh, Dan? I, and then Donna. I think no, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. You know, if we do close down a section of Langdon Street, who is exactly going to be responsible for doing that closing and then doing that reopening? Um, and, you know, will there be liability on the city? Um, 
if, for example, you know, there is an accident in someone um, not anticipating a portion of that street being closed. Um, those are my initial concerns. Um, I, I talked with a couple of business owners along Langdon Street after our, our visit. And, you know, I think Connor's right is that we're really talking about two businesses here. And to the extent that we can benefit these two businesses, um, I, I, I think the other Langdon Street businesses have no, no issue. Um, and the 4 p.m. closing makes sense. Um, but, uh, you know, I think this is, we have to be clear, first of all, that this is for these two businesses only that this would be proposed. Um, and I think we have to go about it safely. And so I guess I'd like to just talk about how we would see that being done and if there's any sense of liability. It's a great question. Um, so Dan, are you, you're thinking about uh, if it's only closed from 4 p.m. Uh, till something like 9 p.m. every or later, I'm, I need to dig, like get back. Or ten, yeah, or ten p.m. You know, how do we how do we make people aware of it on you know the the traffic flow? Um, you know, if somebody comes around onto Langdon Street, you know, obviously we're talking there'd have to be some uh, device or something that could stop them. And who's going to move that in and out of the street each day? Would it be the city's responsibility or would it be a private? uh entities responsibility um you know and and is there a liability to the city if if that's done improperly um or somebody forgets to reopen it and somebody crashes at midnight after it should have been reopened um those are just my initial in thinking about this concerns with doing it this way is to make sure that it's done safely consistently um and without potential risks to the city. So um, what thought on uh, if it was just a thing for emergency vehicles, uh, if it was more or less a permanent um, closure, not at not just time, you know, times of day, does that make it easier? Well, I mean, th then I think you're right. You have the emergency vehicle question. Um, and I think we have the other questions about um, access to these businesses, um, rerouting traffic, because at that point, you know, what we had what we had talked about on that site visit, or what we I observed at least, is that you'd be redirecting the flow on the north or the east part of Langdon Street, you know, so that we become a two-way street um, in and out back onto Main Street. Um, but any of the businesses like Jay Langdon or the get up, um, you know, where would their sort of deliveries or pickups occur? Um, the, and as well as the apartments, uh, on either side, uh, or those businesses like Rome that would be in the middle of that, that closed street, that would be my concern. I know four o'clock, it seemed like a good sort of compromise because it, would be towards the end, if not the end of retail hours and the beginning of dining hours. Um, and I thought that was, you know, what, one of the good compromises, but I, I, I think the problems are, they're different, um, but they're still there, whether it's, uh, um, you know, permanently closing down the street, then how do we deal with the businesses that aren't benefiting from the closure if it's temporarily, closing down the streets, how do we deal with the temporary closures? Th those okay. are my, my concerns that I didn't necessarily see a, a clear answer to in, in the proposed plan, um, and I thought I'd, I'd raise them. Okay, thank you. Um, I thought I saw a hand from Donna, but maybe I imagine that. And I wasn't sure if Bill wanted to respond to the liability. Well, and then um, Jay, after that, go, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I don't know that I have a specific answer about the liability. I'd have the same questions. I can tell you that we at staff didn't really vet through um, a time of day type option. So that is not yeah. one that we have given thought logistically to. I think typically we 
don't like those for a lot of the reasons that Dan said. You have unpredictability. Uh, who's going to close it? Who's going to open it? Uh, all those kind of things. But um, we, if you're you, if you're going to consider that, uh, like you know, a chance for us to get you better feedback on that. Okay, uh, Donna then Jay. Well, I guess I was a little confused about Dan talking about time of day because it wasn't a, one of the five proposals, and I'd be. Just to go through them one to five, I would be really disappointed if we left it as it was. And the second option, Bill, you say this does not require additional safety guards. But if they're parklets, parklets do require safety guards because there's moving traffic. Yes? So when I was talking about safety guards, I'm talking about something that blocks the street and would effectively prevent a car from driving down ah, through. Uh, okay which any street closure will require. Parklets okay. have safety things, but not right. something but, of a more... But uh, you still have the same safety issues for the parklets. Correct, but, but, not, but you have those regardless, uh, even right. okay. in State Street or any other place. Well, okay, but if... And I guess I still have my bias for number three, because I do feel that the community that's at least talking to me wants to see at least some change, even if it's not all the way that they like to see with some major opportunities on our streets and sidewalks. And I do feel that three allows all the business to go through. I feel the liability of partially closing it is no different when we closed it every Saturday uh, a few years ago. I can't remember, it was last year or the year before. I mean, we put up really clear barriers that are removable. So the fire engines, et cetera, police can get through, that if we kept the center for bikes and pedestrians, um, I feel that's a way of encouraging outdoor space. And I do think the retail stores also will find their customers being more comfortable waiting outside as they take turns going in and out, if there's other things going on. And to me, having the shops be able to put things in the parking spaces without being as large an investment as a parklet, I think also bodes well for a short summertime trial. Uh, and I think if indeed Three Penny want to come around the corner uh, into the street, uh, maybe there's something we can accommodate them in that portion that's closed. So um, Three gets my vote. Uh, I don't like the idea of closing the street in the entirety, number five, because I think it's unfair for all the moving parts of people who live and work and businesses who depend on vehicles to get in and out. So that's all. Great, thank you. Uh, Jay. It, it, it's back it up just a little bit, but I just wanna add my perspective, having gone through this process with the city around closing Park Avenue, um, to, to relocate the playground outside of Union Elementary when we were doing construction of the new playground. Um, and to, um, to Dan's point, um, I think that what's, what, what's so important in, in having sat down with Bill and, and fire and public works and police, um, and I see Bob Gowns is on the call too, um, is consistency is consistency equals safety. And so when we were talking about could we open, op close it down during school or during recess hours and open it back up, everybody was in agreement that having to change it every day and maybe having it different on weekends, whether relative to school days and what if the kids are on vacation, et cetera, it just be having an inconsistent traffic pattern was just not safe. Um, you know, regardless of liability, it just, it just didn't work. It wasn't safe. It was not practical to be able to open and close based on um, any regular, you know, somewhat irregular and unpredictable schedule for all the reasons I think, you know, Dan and others have mentioned. So I think any option that we look at, it makes sense to look at something that will, will be one way and stay that way for, you know, whether it's when, when it's approved to when we, to you know, when it's too cold <laughs> um, and we decide to open it back up to how it is now. So I think that that type of approach is, is works best for all our agencies and ultimately is the safest. So finding that balance with what can work best with the businesses 
um, in using that framework should be how we proceed. Um, I'll just jump in here and say I agree that whatever we do, it should be uh, not a, not depending on time of day um, to make it easier. Um, uh, Dan and then Jack and then Connor. Um, yeah, I just a a point of clarification on on number three. I didn't un understand necessarily that um, number three was was necessarily closing down the center travel lane. Is is that the vision for number three? Is that um, it would close it would close Langdon Street to to cars um, and make the parking because I understood it to turn the parking spaces into a walking lane. And allow the businesses to use the sidewalk. They didn't necessarily understand that the center travel lane would 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 necessarily alter in that. Um, and I, I agree with everyone. I mean, I it, what I was looking at was both point four or option four with with the conversation that we've had before about having sort of timed. But I think that's that's off the table. But I just want to make sure I understand option three. So you do, Dan, I think, um, and I didn't really catch it in the earlier conversation. Um, I got three and four confused in my head, but I didn't have the thing up. Uh, so three is intended to still have vehicle traffic going through. My uh, mistake. And, and that the, basically what we do is convert the, the, the parking spaces to the sidewalk. People would walk where the, the parking spaces are and the merchants could then use the sidewalks to expand out or serve dinner on and that kind of thing. And so it's got the advantage that it doesn't close the street down and it might be easier to have seating tables out. You know, it doesn't require as much of a structure to, to put stuff right. on the sidewalk as it does in the parking space. But the downside is then you've got people walking in an unprotected, you know, we'd probably have to put some kind of cones or something along there to delineate well, that was my question. Mistake. I referred to the wrong number. I, I added the confusion. I apologize. It's number four that I was talking about, Dan. Sorry. Okay. Um, so at least in number three, the what we would be putting up would be the little ramps to get on and off the sidewalk for accessibility issues. And then perhaps like cones or something similar to create that walking space in the in the parking lot. I mean, in the parking space. Area is that right, Bill? That's right. Okay. Okay, and just to jump back, Donna, just to clarify, your preference was for is four. four. I, I, the wrong was, number. Yeah, I like the partial shutdown of the street, and nothing about partial times, full time. Okay. Down there um, by where on the other side of outdoors sports so all the roadways and parking spaces are available so you'd have two-way in the first little portion and then you close it down so it's number four my got the wrong number um, jack here i think we're next yes thank you um i uh, i'm a little bit worried about m missing an opportunity and uh you know to see how things are, are really going to, could work and how we could change the, uh, the environment of the city. But uh, I think I'm a little more worried that uh, we really have had a hard time to have a fully studied and considered uh, fully studied a consideration of all the options. And I think it's really pretty hard. I, I think doing something like four seems like something that's going to be confusing and uh, difficult for, uh, for the uh, road users to uh, to interact with um, the op option three of uh, having that walking lane just seems like kind of a 
worrying thing to me. You know, even even if we're putting in semi-permanent uh, barriers, um, having people walking uh, in what's now the parking spaces alongside the moving traffic seems problematic, and so. I think that even though it's the it's kind of the least imaginative and uh, least ambitious of the options, the thing that I think is the easiest to manage and the most practical, given the limited time we've uh, given ourselves to discuss this, is uh, is option two of just uh, allowing all the businesses on the street to uh, to put a parklet in uh, what are now parking spaces if uh, if they want to do that. Okay, uh, Connor. I, I think I could probably be accused of uh, the last book I read here, but you know, and just just talking with Melissa and uh, and Brad there. It's, I guess the question is like, why are we doing this? If not to be able to save a couple businesses here, they're being pretty explicit that they can't open with the 25% capacity and it's not viable for them to keep doing takeout here. So if this saves two businesses, and I think it's a very real possibility we could have empty storefront there, um, maybe now is a time to be a bit bold, be a bit imaginative. And sure enough, there's, there's gonna be some dents in the armor here, I think, that we need to adjust as we go forward. Um, but yeah, I think I'm, I'd also re reiterate some of the points Donna made there. So I would be pretty solid on four on this one. Um, Lauren or a, any interest in sharing your thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of the, the various perspectives and I've been struggling a little because I, you know, like I love the vision of long-term trying to close the street to traffic and I'm struggling with this year being a time when we don't want to create a public gathering space per se. So some of what we would want to model, like we're being discouraged from doing. Um, I mean, I, I, I could support the, the number for closing it down, helping those businesses. Um, I think I think we could make it work. It would be a little confusing to some people, but I think people could figure it out and, and, and we could, we could make that work. Um, you know, otherwise I think the parklets is, you know, seems like the, the next best option, uh, number two, you know, and I, I guess it just comes down to if it really is the difference between what's going to make viable businesses, like if the parklets is not actually helping the businesses, um, or, you know, a couple of those businesses, then, then that it seems like maybe we should try the more ambitious thing. I mean, we could always, you know, we could be obviously continually assessing and if there's some more dramatic problems than we realize, you know, nothing's forever. We could, <laughs> we could reassess if we needed to, but it seems like we could figure out how to do, um, do the number four option and, and try to make it work. Um, Jack and then, um, oh, and, and then Jay. Um, one of the questions I had about number four and, you know, I'm, uh, I, 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 it's something I would really like to see work, uh, when we were, uh, viewing the, uh, location last week, one of the things that we were discussing and measuring was, whether we have uh, enough room on the on the road to have uh, parking on at least one side of the street, which obviously do because that requires because right now we have two lanes of parking and uh, and one lane of uh, traffic and instead we just be swapping one lane of parking for one lane of traffic. But if we were to adopt four, I would want to. Uh, remove probably want to remove the parking on both sides for uh to make that a little uh more manageable i don't know what uh, other people think about that that's an interesting thought there um you know i, I think my guess is that 
really what we're going to end up doing tonight is choosing a direction. It's not um, definitive that like, oh, you know, we're, we're officially making this change right now. Am I, is that, um, it depends on what we choose, I suppose. That was my suggestion. That was going to be my suggestion. If you choose four, um, you know, we're going to need to work with it a little bit more to just figure out the logistics. Uh, you know, I, I, I think from a driver perspective, taking out the parking spaces and having two-way traffic there is probably the safest. But I would imagine if I were book spieler, um, you know, I'm not getting the benefit of the closed street and then I just lost the parking spots in front of my business. Um, there's a new business opening on the other side of the street that may be using a takeout window that wouldn't mind having parking in front. Um, so, you know, I think we need to, we need to work through some of those details and figure out exactly uh, what turning radii are going to look like and what road widths are, you know, we may need to come back to and say, yeah, we do need to take out parking lanes, in which case, you, you know, we may hear from those businesses, you know, we're not going to do anything physical until we've laid it all out. Right. Uh, we'll, if there's a problem with any of it, we'll let you know and we can talk about it. Okay. That makes sense. Um, Jay. So uh, I, I just want to, um, say that I fully agree with uh, Jack and Lauren's thoughts about this being an opportunity to don't want to miss an opportunity to be bold and make a make a change that may not be the easiest but at the, at the end of the day um, will help improve the downtown experience and and in doing so supports um, supports businesses as, the, as we manage through the, you know, the transition to them opening back up. I, I guess my just real practical um, concern with number four is, um, and, and Connor, maybe you can help me with some sort of like uh, math or, or geometry here in terms of, um, <laughs> sorry, no, I, sorry about that. Never mind. Um, but just in terms of like pra what's practical for Langdon Street, tavern because if we talk about closing for just when we were out there it would be just beyond um access to that parking space where like this wcax parking spots are and and those um those buildings on the left hand side of the road are so ultimately what we're closing is mostly bridge you know so is it even is it even realistic for langdon street to move out and then go onto the move their tables onto the bridge and then bring them back in to to create space for themselves um i mean i know that you know we're, we're not closing space that's in front of businesses um you know i know that at sweet melissa's at the other other side of the bridge yeah that would open up some you know more space for them but i just don't know what's practical for for jay langdon and then on a it's a very small thing but i think is is relevant here um uh and, and it came up from a constituent to dan and i and i think it came up at the meeting last time uh our last meeting is that um it, there is at the end of langdon there is a drive up um mailbox and it's the only one on a one-way street and so we heard from someone who has really young children who are too young to the who, who, who a mom who can't leave them in the car so she can go in the post office um but uh so it's really the the most practical way for her to be able to put something in the mail um i know there's lots of drop boxes all over the city but they're not necessarily a, accessible um, for a driver without having to get out of the car. And that's a small thing, um, but it is a consideration um, when we think about cutting access off to that second half of, uh, of Langdon. Um, Donna. Uh, Juan, you should tell the woman you talked to that she can leave letters to mail in her own mailbox and her postmaster will take it. And maybe she doesn't know it though. So that might be helpful information for her to learn. I mean, I've heard from Brad. I mean, Connor and I talked to him right out there in the street, and he felt having some open places that he can put tables way far away, as he said, beyond the two parking spaces most parklets are, that would really help him. And Melissa also felt they could come around the corner onto the bridge and spread out tables. So 
I think for them it's very important, but I also think the retailers may underestimate what benefit for them as far as people on the street. And I, I do think it's an opportunity um, to try something out. And yet we're not encouraging gathering, but we are encouraging people to go to those stores because there's now more human space instead of so much car space. Um, Dan, and then also just being conscious of the time, I would love to um, see what people's first choices are and um, see if there's uh, consensus. If people want to, if have if people have a second choice, that would be good to know as well. But um, we'll we'll start with that. Uh, but go ahead, uh, Dan, and then Cameron. Sure. Um, I, you know, I did talk to a number of the retailers along uh, Langdon Street, and I they're they're not interested in, in this being outside. It's a cost for them. Um, you know, something like Bookspieler, they'd have to. They'd have to put up extra staffing that they can't afford to have to have people outside uh, or have part of their business outside. Um, and I think someone like Juliana at Jay Langdon, this is a hardship. And she said, you know, she's a team player and she wants to have businesses succeed. Um, but, you know, she expressed to me, at least, that this was not something that that she was driving. Um, but I'll you know, so. I'll express, I'll, I'll start with the whole uh, top choices, which would, um, you know, I, I guess I would, my first choice would be th three, then two. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Cameron. Oh, I just wanted to um, uh, recognize Constantinos, who's had his hand up, so I do want him to be um, oh, great. Sorry. Well, maybe we can take uh, Constantinos's comment right now if he's ready. Hi. Yeah, I'm ready. So I just want to support closing of Landing, Landing Street. Uh, it was kind of, if you look at the, um, the downtown master plan that SE Group put together, one of the, uh, I think it was um, Proposal A actually had a redesign of Langdon Street to be uh, more of a pedestrian plaza. So it makes sense to, to follow some of that. It is one of the recommendations that we were given by a consultant that we paid for uh, to give us that recommendation. Uh, also, given that there's lower traffic volumes now because of COVID-19, uh, microtransit coming sometime in the fall possibly, uh, less demand for parking, uh, it might be beneficial to have more space, as Donna said, for, for humans and less for, for parking. Uh, would also support the businesses there, especially the ones struggling uh, especially the food businesses there. Um, the other businesses are not too far from either Elm Street or uh, Main Street um, for parking or delivery purposes. There's also that alleyway uh, that they have access to. Uh, I'd also like to mention that at the Montpelier Infrastructure Transportation Infrastructure Committee, we've also talked about uh, closing streets to allow for more uh, distancing. Um, so, um, you know, take advantage of that reduced traffic to temporarily make some streets car-free, specific in Langdon is what we spoke about. Uh, creating temporary barriers to create one-way streets so that half the street could be reserved to non-motorized traffic and pedestrians, keep traffic flowing, but create loops, for example, loops of one-way streets between State and Allen or Elm to school, uh, take advantage of reduced parking needs to temporarily remove parking spots, provide extra space for non-motorized pedestrian traffic, and maybe make sidewalks one way to avoid people rubbing shoulders while crossing uh, each other. So, um, you know, I'm speaking for myself here, but it is something that's been on the infrastructure committee's agenda as well. Thank you. Um, Dan, go ahead. Uh, two things. One, I just wanted to quickly clarify Jay's um, concerns about uh, which part of Langdon would be closed. Um, and we'll note that um, even with closing it just beyond the CAX parking lot, um, the road would still be closed in front of the buildings that contain Onion River Outdoors, uh, Langdon Street Tavern, Rome, the Getta, and Bookspieler, so, um, and Jay Langdon, rather. Um, so not Bookspieler, but the Getta and, and Jay Langdon. So, um, so there would be space in the closed street in front of Langdon Street Tavern, um, not just on the bridge, as uh, Jay said. Um, the other thing I just want to flag is the question of um, fairness. Um, I absolutely believe that every single business deserves saving um, and that we should do whatever we can. Um, 
I am a little bit concerned about the notion that um, the businesses that are not on Langdon Street are going to, you know, only have the parklet option, including the sidewalk parklets, um, you know, but um, limited space to expand and potential costs that um, Langdon Street businesses may have, a, you know, extra space and uh, less costs because they do you know, they wouldn't need to install a parklet necessarily. So um, just something to, something to think about in this conversation. Thank you. Okay. Um, so just going through folks' first and possibly second choices, if you have one, um, we've got Dan's. Um, anyone else want to weigh in? Um, was that Connor? Connor? Did I see a hand? Go ahead. No surprise. I'm very obviously four here. Um, again, if it saves a couple of businesses, maybe gets five or six people back to work. Um, that's what it's all about here. I guess, I guess I'd give three as a distant second choice. Okay. Go ahead, Donna. Sure. I mean, four. I think four would be my second choice, too. <laughs> Depends how you add it up. If not four, then I might end up going to two. Okay. Uh, Lauren. Um, I would do four and then two. Anyone else? Jack or Jay? So how many, is that three votes for four right there yes. is, is their top choice? Yes. I, I think I really, weirdly would go with the think of two is my first choice and four is my second choice but uh but I, I would i would support four because i think that uh, i'd be it it does give us a chance to try out at least a partial uh closure of the street and see uh see what the effect is um i i don't know if that we're making actually voting on an ordinance today, I don't think we can. Um, I, it'd be kind of interesting, and I don't know if it's practical to do it, but it'd be kind of interesting to uh, some evening or some day when, there's, when there are not people out there in the cars to actually try closing down the street for an hour or two and have have a few volunteers pull their cars in and out, try it out, and see how it would work having uh, having that end of uh, Langdon Street open and two way traffic on it. You know, do a simulation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jay. Yeah. Well, um, I. I just really appreciate everybody's thoughts on this and, and how we could see making it work. Uh, honestly, um, it, it, my first choice would be five. If, if the city managed, if the city's off, if we could figure out a way to make it work. Um, you know, I know that there's considerations with emergency vehicles um, and uh, providing access for deliveries, but I think that that's, uh, always doable and, and adaptable. Um, but if, if that, if we didn't think that that was feasible, then, then I would support number four as well. Okay. Interesting. Um, so just, uh, so that you all know where I stand on it as well. I think my, my first choice would also be four and, uh, probably my second choice would be two. Um, but, um, sounds like the, um, most folks had four either as first or second. Um, another popular choice was two, though, um, only one person had two as their first choice. Um, so one thought would be, um, that we could be asking the city manager to come back with more. Uh, potentially like more, a more plan for four um, or 
I'm wondering if we need to vote on that. Prob- probably we do. Um, or do we want to keep two um, sort of in the running here? Or we could just direct it as like, you know, we're narrowing it to two or four. Uh, unless, unless folks have other um, thoughts. So two won't require any work from us. I mean, it's already, it's actually already included in the ordinance you passed the first yeah. reading earlier tonight. So that's really on the businesses to, to put their things in. I would say if, you, if you're seriously considering four, and that's the message I'm getting loud and clear, then we need to lay it out and have our traffic folks take a look at turning rate, you know, really come give it even more detailed look uh, as quickly as we can. Okay. Get it back to you um, as soon as possible. Okay. Um, and uh, so uh, do you feel like you need a, a motion on that? I mean, it's, it's really just in more investigation at this yeah, point. I think if you want to direct us to research motion four more thoroughly and report back ASAP, that would be great. Okay. Um, I, Dan. Yeah, I, I don't think we necessarily need a motion. I mean, I think we've had a straw poll and there's, um, you know, clear direction. And given that we're not necessarily locked into um, option four until it's we see if it's feasible, because now now we're down to the engineering and the turning radiuses, and if they come back and say it doesn't work, I don't, right. I don't think we it would make sense to have it locked in. I mean, I think you know people have expressed a clear direction, and it would be foolish say to to plan out three when there's no other person supporting it. But that would be my sense. No, that, that makes sense to me as well. Um, okay, so we'll revisit that at another meeting. <laughs> not not Friday. Friday. <laughs> not Friday. Um, okay, so the only other item that we have on our agenda for the evening is the uh, FY21 budget. And um, so I want to just check in with Bill. Uh, how urgent is this one? Um, or can we take it up at the next meeting? Not Friday. Uh, not Friday. Um, it's pretty important. Um, you know, this is, I guess it depends on how you want to, you know, we, we've got to make decisions and we've got to notify people about their status, um, you know, for July 1 and, um, you know, the next meeting, scheduled meeting is June 24. Um, okay, well, uh, how, are, how are you feeling, team, about uh, giving this uh, some time here before we close this evening? Thumb, thumb scale of, of good to go? Okay, I'm, I'm willing, so, okay, it sounds like everybody else is, so let's dive in. Okay, great, thanks. And while, so Kelly was gonna come on while she's getting set up so showing her screen, I'll just say that the good news is we, you know, we do have a proposal that balances, or at least we think it balances. She's got a presentation to walk you through. I mean, obviously you may disagree with our recommendations and that's fine. Um, but at least uh, hopefully we can move through this pretty quickly. It's not stuff you haven't seen before or heard before already. So Kelly. And unmute yourself too. <laughs> All right, got it. I'm going to now. Um, so I'll take you through this. Um, and I'll take you have this. terrible sound. Terrible <laughs> sound. Yeah. <laughs> Hear me okay now? No, it really can't work if we if it's going to be that bad. Kelly, like, can we actually get you to log off and then log back on or something? It's bad. You also could be near another electronic device from the sound of it. Oh, there you go. If I move my, my laptop, laptop, is that better? No. 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 All right, let me log back on. Isn't that odd? Weird. Yeah. You know, we didn't we didn't get this presentation right. It isn't anything we can pull up. No, you didn't, because um, we were still vetting numbers today. But no, you got no. the outline. You got an outline on in the 
packet of a preliminary. And, then we've... and that's fine. I just want to make sure I didn't miss an email, Bill. That's all. Yeah. Thanks. Um, while we're waiting for Kelly, I know we're jump, exactly, while we're jumping all around, we might as well continue. Anyone have a council report they'd like to offer? Donna. I have just so enjoyed our cemeteries and all my walks almost daily and Green Mountain out on State Street because they haven't been able to mow. It's just the most bountiful of grasses, all these colors and wildflowers. I was telling Patrick, I saw him in the truck in one of my walks, that I hope they don't mow in May and June next year. It is so pretty. And the, they're just beginning to fade now. So if you haven't gone through the cemetery recently on State Street, please do so. It's just lovely, really lovely. Thank you, Donna. Uh, Kelly. And maple trees, lots of maple trees, huge. Uh, can you hear me okay now? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, perfect. So, <laughs> and you can see my screen. Um, no, not, not yet. yet. Not yet. Oh, good. Okay, hold on. You have to we'll, read we'll, share that. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there. Hold on, I promise. What about now? Yeah. Excellent. Sound and sight. All right. Okay. So I'm going to walk you through um, quickly. Um, I am a fast talker, so I'm going to try not to be um, for this presentation just so you can get kind of the details. But, um, but and if you have questions, just feel free to holler. Um, but basically, you know, we are facing a um, revenue downgrade of 1.4 million in FY21. Um, the approach that we took is sort of a blended approach based on the experience that we've been seeing with some of the revenue line items, as well as, um, you know, considering what the state's doing with their um, projections. And so we took a, you know, a quarterly approach of a, you know, 2% or so reduction and actually ends up being about, you know, 7 to 10%, depending on what the gap is. Um, but, you know, we've kind of settled here at one4 um, I will say that, you know, we, over the course of doing this, have, you know, learned some favorable information, but at this point, it's not finalized. Um, so I think this is a pretty good estimate. It's a pretty good worst case scenario um, so that we're safe as we're approaching um, this first quarter and we'll kind of have to see what happens. And then we can kind of address it on a quarterly basis and determine whether or not you know, this can be taken down or, you know, if it's not enough, um, there's just a lot of unknowns at this point. Um, and so I do, you know, want to mention some of the things that the revenue downgrade does include in the general fund, the state pilot payment. You know, we may get our um, FY20 allocation at 100%, but we just don't know that yet. And so as soon as we do, um, you'll be the first to know. Um, and then that's part of a conversation for sure. Um, local options tax is really not performing well at all, but that's not surprising given what the businesses are doing um, in town. Um, then ambulance, state highway aid, licenses, fees, and permits, um, you know, round out this set of assumptions. Um, I will say that I did not include property taxes in this um, projection because, you know, historically we've done pretty well with property taxes. Um, right now, to date, um, we'll know more on Monday, of course, because property taxes are due along with water sewer. Um, but to date, you know, we've got about 1.5, almost 1.6 to collect in property taxes. And then, you know, we've also got about 7.4 in water sewer. Um, but, you know, we've also got a lot of auto pays there. So we're trending in the right direction. It's just, we've got to wait and see what happens. Um, you know, there's also um, some room here. We're, we're monitoring 20 pretty closely and I'll get into that in future slides or towards the end, just so you have a perspective of where we are, but we've taken a pretty conservative view just in case if there are some pressure from 20 that bleeds into 21. Um, and then parking, parking's down. We're just, we're not enforcing parking. And so this is the quarterly assumption of not getting any revenue in, in parking. And so that's how we came up with our um, gap. Um, and, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll know a little bit more as time passes, but we've also come up with a listing of um, items to address this. Um, and so here they are. You did get this list in um, semi-final draft form. 
um, in your packets, um, but we've been, you know, um, reviewing it um, with department heads and um, have, you know, gone over this um, in depth. And so there are a few adjustments that we've made around, um, you know, really fine tuning the furlough extension based on, you know, who's on that list. And then also considering the hiring freeze and what that will really look like. Um, so we wanted to bring to the table some items or a lot of items um, for you to consider. Um, and what I will say is the lion's share of this is, you know, all department based, but there are some community enhancements that are listed here and you'll note they're towards the bottom part of the, the table here. And that's about um, 76,000 and some change um, just for summary purposes. So you're kind of aware of that. Um, so then I'm just going to kind of get into the details so that you've got sort of the big picture um, for specific categories. Um, one of them is equipment reductions. And so you can see here um, what we've proposed delaying. Um, and that's, I should also say that that's really what we're trying to do, delay anything that we can, put off projects that we can, and then to the extent that we can um, make up some of the shortfall with um, hiring freezes, COLA and furlough, we're gonna do that as well. So this is part of it. Um, and hopefully, you know, this delay won't last forever. It's just a one-time kind of thing. Um, and we'll, you know, keep moving forward when we can, but here's the list. Um, so of the 515,000 that we had budgeted, um, we're, we would take it down um, by 336.5. Um, so that's that. Um, and then the operating um, projection rejections you can see here are listed out. It's um, $454,000. Um, the one that I will highlight is at the top there. It's the projects from um, Public Works. Um, based on the priority listing from DPW, um, Clarendon, Taylor Street, Westwood Drive, Chestnut Hill Culvert, and crack ceiling will still happen. Um, but then the projects that will be delayed. And so depending on what happens, you know, we'll assess, you know, conditions as, you know, things change. The projects that would kind of come sort of further down the list are Cumming Street, Hubbard Street, Retaining Wall, Berry Street, and Loomis Street Repair. Um, Donna is on the call um, and could speak a little bit more to these if needed. Um, but, you know, that's sort of a thumbnail sketch of, you know, what we're not um what we're going to be doing and what we're not going to be doing. Um, and so I will also note that as part of the FY21 budget for this um, particular group of projects, the amount is about 1.2 or so um, that we'd be taking this from. Um, so there's that. Um, we've got a little bit of contract savings and finance. Um, the facilities project manager is is, you know, sort of all the facilities within um, citywide service are, you know, maintained and we currently have a contract in place with the assessor that would just be held vacant until we can, you know, address it, you know, at a later date when we have the resources. Um, planning, um, this is their professional development money, postage, supplies. It's also um, the conversion of one um, FTE 2.8. Um, and then Parks gave us a, you know, suite of savings of about $20,000 and the clerk's office also kicked in 2.8. Um, okay, and then, you know, moving on to the community enhancement pieces, um, since we're not having a 4th of July celebration, we thought that it probably was a good idea to consider that as, you know, something that's on the list. Um, the development corporation, it's a 25% reduction over, you um, what was appropriated. Um, the arts fund is also uh, 25%. Um, and then getting on into the housing trust fund, again, 25%. Homelessness task force, uh, 25%. And then the Emerald Ash War, um, there's still some money remaining, but that's a 20% reduction over the 14K that we had put in the budget. And let me know if I'm moving too fast. Um, but it looks like everybody's still with me, so that's good. Um, so personal services reductions, um, we are focusing this pretty conservatively. It's the general fund um, portion of COLAs at 2% that um, staff would be receiving. This does not include fire um, because they're currently still under uh, contract. Um, 
so that's that piece and we'll be monitoring that as we go along and then if things get better then that's maybe something that we consider restoring but at this point i think it's safe to say that it's something we should really um, hold back um, and then furlough extensions so based on department conversations um, we've determined that out of the 25 employees that have kind of remained in that pool of furloughed employees 10 would return to work um, based on need um, and so they would come back on July 1, um, and then the remaining 15 would stay out until July 31st and come back on August 1st. Um, so there's that. And then the hiring freeze, you know, we took an assessment of um, our current pool, pool of employees, current vacancies, but then those that will become vacant in FY21 um, and did sort of a, a tiered approach. And you'll see in a future slide um, what that looks like, what the positions are and the departments that are impacted. It's um, finance and public works that um, are going to be um, shouldering this. And, you know, I think we can manage, um, but we've got sort of an approach in terms of the lion's share of them are from public works, but we don't, we still need them to do the work. Um, so some of those positions would be held vacant on a quarterly basis so that then we could put them back in play as soon as is reasonable. And then some of them um, will remain out for the full year based on our known assumptions. Um, so you can see here based on the notes, it's um, 7.6 FTEs, 3.6 for all of FY21, four for the first quarter. Um, and then in this calculation is also a police position that would shift to um, the task force. So they go from 17 to 16 positions that are generally funded. So here's the table for the um, hiring freeze impacts. Um, and so you can kind of just see a rough cut on what's well, not so rough. It's actually um, based on what we would be paying for these positions. Um, and so I still have in here the, the benefit totals, but then part of the, the grand total here is where I really want to point your, your attention. And then the, the full year and quarterly calculation is really what um, our uh, placeholder is based on. And so we'll keep monitoring this pretty, pretty closely. The green bar are those positions um, that would uh, remain uh, vacant for the full year. And then the clear bar would be the ones um, that would end up being filled if it's possible um, on the quarter, depending on how revenues come in. So moving on, I also want to note that um, you know, and I, I could underscore this more, but I'm just gonna, just for you know, time's sake, kind of go over it really quickly, but you can kind of see the slide, but there will be operational impacts because of this. You know, we're gonna do our best to mitigate them and we're gonna, um, there are definitely some silver linings here, I think in terms of, you know, assessing what we're doing, how we're doing it and deficiencies to be gained. But, you know, there are still areas where it's not business as usual. And, um, you know, we recognize that and we're trying our best, but we also want to just kind of put that out there too. So folks understand that, you know, there may be some limitations um, and hopefully things will get better. And then, you know, we can kind of, you know, pivot. We're setting ourselves up to be able to do that once things do um, improve. And so I wanted to give you also a quick um, look at FY20 and what that looks like. You look at the bottom line down here, based on our rough assessment of the gap that we were projecting back in April, we've closed that gap. Um, and so we've got about 26.3 on the bottom line, but I am a little bit, res uh, just a little bit cautious to really even call that out because, you know, we've got to see what happens in the final weeks of the fiscal year and what comes in, what goes out, you know, what we're dealing with in terms of, um, you know, cash flow, and we're expecting a few things to happen. So, this is still in flux, it's not firm, um, but it's at least, I think, uh, a positive reflection on the actions that have been taken um, to make sure that we've been managing in these conditions. So I think that's really great. Um, and then I also wanted to put a list out there of additional things to consider that are currently not um, contemplated and do need to be funded in some fashion in 21. Um, one of them is the TKS, TKS property, excuse me, and we, talked about this a while back um, and I'll start keeping a running list just as a reminder of like things that are out there. Um, the elevator still need to be addressed. Thankfully, nobody's been in the building, so we're square there, but eventually, 
you know, we really are going to need to do something about that. Uh, Confluence Park was something that was mentioned um, during the budget process and was put in. And we just need to really um, identify that source within the budget. Things have changed so rapidly since, um, you know, the budget was adopted in March that, you know, we just need to figure out where we're going to identify how, and what that's coming from. Um, we did put the parking meter upgrade on here for $365,000. Um, this one we need to vet just a little bit um, because there may be, you know, um, fees that may net against this once we decide to do the upgrade. But basically what it is is the, the internal upgrade within the meters themselves. Um, and so it's a pricey proposition and hopefully we can maybe get that down a little bit. But who knows at this point, it's just out there for your consideration. Um, and then the reappraisal in FY22, um, this figure is a little bit lower based on the bids that we did receive. So that's a uh, step in the right direction. Um, but all told in FY21, there's $619,000 of expenses that we've got to just figure out how to fit into our current construct. Um, so I just put that out there because even though um, I think, you know, we've got, a, you know, a manageable task at hand with the um, reductions that we've identified. There are still things that are hanging out there that we'll also need to address. Um, and so recommendations, um, and then I'll kind of, if you've got questions or if you want me to um, flip back to some previous slides, I'm happy to do that, um, is to operationalize our savings initiatives to kind of put things on ice and on hold, you know, so that then we can kind of preserve our resources so that then we're in a good spot to respond and react as things happen. Um, and we'll continue to monitor things really closely. Um, and then, you know, once things do improve, because they will, it's just, I don't know when that'll be, and it's probably not going to be any time in the near future. Um, we'll consider restoring some of those reductions. Um, and we'll start working on that list too. Um, so that then there's a plan. So this, the idea of tonight is really to get a plan in place so that then we're squared away um, and then we'll report quarterly. So that's what I have. Um, and with that, I will leave it up to Bill or Cameron to take it from I there. Just add, I just add, right, we'd like you to, to consider approving the plan or changing it however you wish. And then the key to it is we're not asking you to actually change our, our approved budget. We're simply saying here's our plan for managing since the the revenue projections have changed. Um, and part of that is we want to review this with you every quarter to see, you know, our revenue is looking better than we thought. What, what could we do in it? You know, what could maybe be changed or added back in or are they worse? So we'll be continuing to watch this every three months. Well, we'll be watching it all the time, but you'll be dealing with it every three months. If things improve or some of the revenues come in higher than we thought, then we can look at maybe in the second half of the year, you know, doing some of the projects that were delayed or um, purchasing some of the equipment that we'd put off um, because, you know, the fiscal year goes all the way till next June uh, or looking at our staffing at that point or dealing with some of those undealt with problems uh, instead. Uh, so you know, we've got some time to look at this, but that, this is staff and particularly Kelly have put in a, a lot of hard work trying to make this work. Yeah, that seems pretty clear. Um, so I uh, saw Dan and then who else? Uh, then Lauren, yeah. And then Jack. Well, I'll say thanks. Thanks, Kelly. And thanks, Bill and Cameron for putting this together. It's really um, in-depth, thoughtful. Um, and it has, you know, it, it does the heart heavy lifting that uh, I'm very glad I don't have to do um, to, <laughs> to comb through this. But I did have one question. Are there any savings on the rec department that we're not opening the pool uh, this summer or limiting some of those services, you know, similar to how you put the 4th of July parade savings in? Um, is there a similar savings or is there is it just not a savings? Unfortunately, no. I mean, we did look at that. Um, there is some maintenance that needs to happen at the pool, but the pool, you know, kind of ends up funding itself uh, through the user fees. And in some time, and sometimes we, you know, end up, you know, it is an expensive thing to open. Um, so that being said, there, there's not savings there to be, um, 
garnered to add to this. Um, I wish there were, you know, we are looking at it from a perspective of maybe doing some maintenance on the pool that, you know, otherwise wouldn't be able to be done. Um, so, so the startup fees that, that would normally be incurred in the budget are going to be transferred over to the maintenance. Well, as some of those we took as we've already counted in FY 20 is closing that initial $500,000. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, this is from July on. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, okay, Lauren, and then I think it was Jack. Um, yeah, thanks. And I, I agree with Dan. This is very thorough and the presentation of a lot of information, but like very clear and, and thoughtful. Um, so thanks for all the work that has gone into that. Um, I just had two quick questions. One was um, like how, so if we put off things like equipment purchases and things. I know sometimes there can be like delays and doing that just to have, I guess maybe it's a, a thought for when you're thinking about, okay, if, if we were in the fortunate position of some money, more money came in than we've um, anticipated here, just like that consideration of which things would take more lead time to do versus we could like turn a, turn a switch and bring staff back in or, you know, things like that. So I guess just, just putting that out there to, um, some thought on that, like as we look at the plan for how we could phase in if we ended up in the fortunate position of being able to put some things back in. Um, and I guess my other question just had to do with the furloughs for staff. So I know it was just handled so well um, at the beginning, um, offering it as a voluntary thing. And I was just kind of curious at this point, I know you said it was based on needs for um, pe some people coming back and some people staying on furlough. Are people like clamoring to come back it, and you know, we just have to do it because of the budget or are some people like, this is great, <laughs> I'm home with my family or, or whatever. I'm just curious what the, what the sentiment is and if there's, you know, if, if there's considerations we should be aware um, there. People, there's, a, there's a little bit of both. You know, there are people that this is really working well for. Um, but the thing with furloughs is, you know, some of it's, you do have the right to call them back. And, and people understood this, that it was going to be till at least July 1 and, and potentially till August 1st. So what we asked all the departments to do was to tell us, you know, kind of where, where do you, who do you need? Like, especially with summer coming, you know, um, and one of the areas we've really noticed, you know, our building inspector has been on furlough and it's summer, people are building. This is, you know, um, we, we need, and the nice part is some of, uh, he is also covered by fees and revenues so he can help pay for himself. But So that's one we just needed back. The, the assistant city clerk, for example, um, you know, we've got an election coming in August. So John needs her back, really needs her back now, but he certainly needs her back in July. So, you know, a lot of this was program-based need, uh, and for those that could stay for another month, uh, we're trying to take the savings on it. And we have thought about, you know, the timing on equipment and all that stuff. We can, we can still order stuff this year and book it to this year, even if it doesn't arrive, I think, uh, if we don't take, anyway, so. Start the timing talking. game. Um. Yeah. Yeah. You know, pushing, I mean, none of these are great ideas in general. I mean, they're great ideas for meeting the crisis that we have. You know, delaying, keeping up with projects, you know, that's that's not good, but it's the best we have to work with and still deliver basic services. Yeah. Um, Jack. Thanks. Um, I had a similar to a uh, question or observation from as Lauren made about the uh, furlough and I should just say that I, I do have a family member who's uh, who's a city employee who is uh, on one of these voluntary furloughs and I don't know from looking at this whether that person is affected by the extension or not but uh, so, um, but the question that uh, occurs to me is that it uh, if if the city went to people and uh, said, well, we would like you to take a furlough through the end of June, and now they're being told that they're losing another month's pay, 
Um, whether that's really fair that those are the people that should get the burden where uh, you compare that burden as opposed to considering whether some other employees, if, uh, if we need to lay off some set of employees for uh, the month of July, whether that should go to, uh, whether that should be borne by those same employees or other employees um, and thinking into the future, not that we're hoping to have, be in this position in the future, but uh, it makes me wonder if people who thought they were going to be laid off to Ju July 1st and now are going to be laid off to August 1st, if what effect that's going to have on people's willingness to accept a voluntary furlough in the future. Um, so we were, I think people are okay with this. I'd have to go back and we can find you the communications we have the employees. I think it was always clear that this could be till August 1st. There was never any question about that, that it might be as soon as July 1st, but it was, could be till August 1st. And that's as long as the federal, the extra $600 a week continues. So we believe that most of the people that are, in fact, we're pretty sure that most of the people that are taking advantage of this are being held, are held harmless financially. In fact, some may even be benefiting. Um, so I'm not sure anyone's paying a price for the extra month. Um, and and I, I haven't had direct communication with them, but I know our HR people have. And I, I, I believe we're on pretty solid ground here as far as employees understandings of this. We Thank are, Bill. Oh, we definitely are. We checked that out through Public Works um, over a week ago, and all the uh, documents that our furloughed staff signed said that it could um, go through the end of July. Last day in July would be their last day being on furlough, but it could have, they could be called back earlier. So, um, I assume that if it was done that way for our department, it was done through HR for everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Donna. Thank you. Uh, Bill, has the staff considered suggesting that we open our meters and start having people use meters? Parking meters? Our parking meters. You know, that's the big revenue hit. Have we considered opening? So, We've talked about it. Um, let's see. Let's be clear. I mean, yes, it's a revenue hit, but really the prime purpose of parking meters is to manage parking, uh, you know, a parking shortage to help provide turnover for businesses. And, you know, when we first stopped this, it was the perception that, okay, we've got a downtown that we're trying to get as what few customers we can. Right. So we've been in pretty constant contact with Dan Groberg about this and the business community. And, you know, we're just starting to open up. So I think, you know, a lot of the cars on the streets right now are employees or owners of businesses that are parking all day. And I don't blame them. You know, why not? Um, so we're going to keep an eye on that and see when, you know, ideally we'd love to have this back open by August 1st so that our parking people don't have any issues with coming back to work. Um, but it also has to be what makes sense for the business community. I mean, we don't want to create a, another disincentive to come downtown, um, you know, if it's already still too tough or not. You know. oh, absolutely. But if indeed we are having more parklets and if we do the aspect with Langdon, we are going to have less parking spaces. And believe it or not, I still see people feeding the meter. You know, uh, if I catch them, I'll say, you don't have to do that. Uh, but, you know, so I, I don't know that it's that big of a burden. Okay, so, but I just wanted to bring it up at some point, maybe just keeping evaluating that and what is the flow? Because it also helps for takeout, moving the cars of the people who are coming into town. And my second question was, it's a bit more about the allocation that happened through the community fund. Those checks usually go out in August and I have had uh, some nonprofits call me about that. Is that still planning 
to happen. Yeah, if you notice, the community fund is not on this list of recommended. I did. <laughs> uh, and it was basically because, I mean, it was our recommendation. You all could reconsider. We have not sent the check, so we could, you know, rescind some of their money. But our sense was we made commitments to groups. They're probably losing funding everywhere else already. Uh, the least we could do is keep our commitment to them and not hit that. And similarly, the commitment to the social justice thing, you know, the council said in the spring, we're going to take it now, but we're not going to take it next year. So we want to make sure we honored our commitments. No. no, and I appreciate not seeing either of those here. I just wanted to make sure because they nonprofits are hurting it and I have heard from several of them. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, I'm grateful for all of this work. Um, it, it makes sense to me and I think it looks good and hopefully we do end up in a better place and we don't need to make all of uh, these adjustments. Um, Dan Groberg, I saw you had something and then Jay. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Kelly and I have a comment. Um, the question is, uh, what, if anything, is the understanding about the state pilot payments within the downtown improvement district um, and whether that may be impacted and whether Montpelier Live could be losing that funding source um, or whether the expectation was maintaining that piece of it. Um, that's about $19,000, which is about a third of the total DID um, money and about 8% uh, of our annual budget. Um, so we don't know yet. Um, I guess that's sort of the long and short of it. Um, we have heard um, sort of favorably on that front um, from two different sources within, you know, one from the administration and one, um, you know, from our delegation, but we, we just don't, we don't know. So I don't, I'm not quite sure how to answer that. I mean, I would like to say that, you know, yes, that, that is part of that figure, but until we actually get it in, we just don't know. So that's why it's still actually included in these revenue projections um, because we just don't know yet what the state's going to do because they are facing some pretty significant um, decreases as well. Um, and so we're just trying to be conservative. Um, and so it's a non-answer and I'm sorry for that. Um, well, they do ahead. split it out. They do split out the general pilot and the downtown pilot. Mm -hmm. um, so probably to be safe, I don't have the number, Kelly may know off the top of her head, you might want to just project whatever percentage we're projecting, 30% or whatever that is from your 19,000. Yeah, it's, it's about 40% based question. on local options tax, what we're seeing for experience. Yeah, so um, thank you. So I just want to uh, flag that for the council that that's sort of a hidden uh, budget cut that you may not have noticed. Um, and then the other piece, and I, I don't, fault anyone for this, but there had been um, discussions with the manager's office about um, the July 3rd funding going towards our um, Moonlight Madness event, which is planned to be our um, sort of reopening kickoff event and where we're um, redirecting a lot of the other resources we have for that July 3rd, including our sponsorship funds. So um, I understand that you have to make difficult choices, but um, that money was would not go to waste um, that it was going to be redirected towards uh, another event. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jay. Well, I, th I think what Dan's comment is a perfect segue just in that I want to uh, try to understand um, process to help manage expectations moving into FY21. I know if we, we're going to move forward with these numbers, um, I appreciate that, but if we find that um, that we we have more um, more of it. There's you know revenue is is higher than what we were expecting. How are we um, going to prioritize making some of these line items whole? And um, and then beyond that, how you know I know you you said there there'd be a quarterly check in. Is that sort of um, 
uh, what how we could communicate with constituents and with folks as, as to when we can let them know if we might be able to 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 make them whole. I mean, I look particular you know with particular concern to economic development as we you know um, hopefully are are in a, in a place where we're recovering, and then of course a lot of the social services that we're um, that we're we're reducing funding for as well. So it's kind of two questions: How do we? What's our timing process wise, and then how are we going to prioritize? So um, I think our, our anticipation is the timing would be a quarterly review and, you know, how are we doing? Have we got hard news? You know, it's to say pilot, that's a pretty big reduction for us in this budget, right? So say we find out we're going to get full funding, you know, that right there will, but we also, that may also offset other projections that we got wrong. So, you know, I think we need to, we need to take a, a look at that, um, so say October 1st, what I would anticipate in terms of prioritizing is that we staff would prioritize, you know, sort of which equipment order and which project order and those kinds of things. And you might prioritize which of these sort of community type things. And then we'd have to weigh, you know, if we have, you know, sort of say, well, how much, how, how, how ahead of revenues are we and how, how soon can we restore these monies? You know, I mean, some of these people, you know, maybe we can't actually make a firm commitment till almost the last quarter of the year to say suddenly, hey, those last community fund, you know, enhancement things, we can make that all up now. We, we know we're good. Uh, which is why, you know, that's why even some of the hiring freeze, we, we set some we thought we could freeze for up to the whole year, others, you know, especially the DPW was like, well, we could probably freeze them for the first quarter, but we need them for plowing. You know, we can't, they were short last winter. We need to make sure they got full crew. Um, so that's the plan to, to have people back on in time for those sorts of things. So just to make sure I'm, I'm understanding you correctly, as, as we review things over the year, and if we were, are, if we do find that we're able to um, make some of these lines just have to do that on a quarterly basis and right. look at time. Um, you set the priorities for the money, so that would be your you'd, you'd approve any changes, right? Okay, or further reductions if it goes the other way, right? Right, okay, good question, though. Um, any other comments? Uh, Cameron, um, so you know, Constantinos is also waiting. Okay, um, you know, now is an okay time. Go ahead. Oh, he's on mute. You're so, muted. Okay. Well, I just want to first thank uh, thank you guys for all the work on this finance stuff. You know, as a CPA, I really understand and appreciate the work that goes into this. You know, Kelly, Bill, and all your staff uh, shows um, you've done a lot of work, and I really appreciate it. So. Uh, you know, I truly understand the typical decisions you need to make and how hard it is to, to get to this point. Um, but I, I'd just like to point out that, you know, at the beginning of a recession that could turn out to be a depression, reducing funding to things like the Public Housing Trust and the Homeless Task Force will probably hurt the most vulnerable people in our city. Uh, you know, these are the exact types of expenses that build our community and decrease the need for policing um, in general, and that we could take more of that fund. So I'd just like to remind you from earlier in this meeting that, you know, you have many of your constituents, including myself, demanding a reduction in the police budget. Um, so please consider looking into tapping those funds to fill your gap. Um, thank you, thank you Assassinos. Um, I just wanna make a note that um, that ask is sent and I don't think that we are prepared to make that decision evening. Um, and uh, we have been putting funding towards the housing trust fund uh, and other community services for a long time. And uh, so, you know, and, and we, you know, once we are back into regular mode, we will be continuing to um, support those services. So, um, thank you. Just wanted to make a note of that. Um, Jack. At this point, if it's appropriate, I move to uh, approve the uh, staff plan for. Uh, uh, to, to bring the uh, budget into balance for uh, fiscal 2001. I don't know if that's the right way to phrase it or approve the uh, decision uh, plan. 
Second. Um, okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, further discussion about the plan. Uh, Lauren. Only other thing, just um, I'm thinking of a little bit sparked by Constantino's comment, but um, you know the the other big moving piece I feel like is also you know so there's potential federal money. There's also a lot of state decisions happening right now with what's happening with our CARES funding. Like I I just saw a brief article about you know a big influx to VHCB for some housing, and you know so I think really keeping a close eye too on where there might be opportunities for doing the kinds of um, projects that can help so that maybe the housing trust fund might do in a typical year. And maybe there's going to be different ways that money's moving around the state in unusual ways this year that we can see, okay, where, where's the greatest need for the community? Is it being met by, um, you know, some other source that's atypical um, or, you know, whatever. So I, I think just, just putting out there to keep an eye on that too, and, and really make sure that the, that the key needs, um, and point well taken about keeping an eye on you know our most vulnerable and um, and how we're addressing those. And just to, you know that is exactly why we try to lay this out as a management plan as opposed to actually changing the budget because we don't know what other kind of monies could be available to us or projects and those kind of things. So it's you know this is this is what we know on June 10. It could be different on June 24. You know it could be different on July 1. So. Uh, this is okay. Uh, Jack. Um, the uh, earlier tonight at our in our uh, consent agenda, we approved the uh, resolution uh, sponsored by the uh, League of Cities and Towns to call for more money from the federal government for relief from the uh, COVID disaster. And I wonder if we have any sense of whether we can expect uh, anything to come from that. Mayor? The mayor oh. not? Um, I, I, do, I will confess I don't have a good sense of whether or not we will um, get any further funding from, but we'll see. Okay. Yeah, I, that's what I figured, but it would be good to know if we knew. Yeah. The HEROES Act in this federal house would be help local governments considerably, but whether it makes itself all the way through. Yeah, I mean, we, um, I, I did have a call with um, Peter Welch the other day in support of that, uh, but it's, um, the chances of it passing are questionable. So we'll see. Thanks. Yep. Um, all right, any comments on this? Um, Dan Groberg is raising his hand. Okay, Dan, go ahead. Um, I, I just wanna express a small concern that I'm not sure that people who, um, they're sort of these outside agencies who may see their um, funding cut were notified that this was being discussed at the meeting tonight. Um, I I know Montpelier a lot. I mean, I happened to be here and <laughs> read the uh, packet because of the other issues that were relevant to us this week, but um, I was not specifically informed um, that there were any of our funding was on the table. Um, and I'm curious whether the other, I, I don't see any representatives from the Development Corporation or the Public Arts Commission or the Housing Trust Fund or Homelessness Task Force. So I'm just wondering whether folks were informed and whether it's um, reasonable to be making having this conversation without them at least having some voice. That's a fair comment, and I think you're right, Dan. Um, I, well, I know I didn't comment contact them, so we could certainly put, you know, put this again on the follow up conversation on this on the next agenda, have this be a preliminary plan and, and give them the opportunity. I think you're right, they should get the chance to speak. So thanks for mentioning that. I knew you and I had a conversation about, we weren't didn't have Montpelier alive in there, but um, yeah, I did not, that was my oversight. So if we approve um, the motion, um, 
that would be a preliminary approval or do you think it's better to table it and go from there? What do you think? Well, I think you could do it either way, actually, because, um, but we, you know, some of these things we need to start putting in, into place. Um, just taking a look at the, the two that he talked about, 20, 30, $57,000. So that's really what we'd be 50, 60, some odd thousand dollars would be saying we've got to cut somewhere else. It means a lot of the rest of this stuff we could, we could be doing anyway. So I, I would say if you approve the plan tonight, give them a chance to come in and make their case. Um, and we'll give some thought to where we would recommend if we had to take it somewhere else. So we could potentially approve it with the exception of those um, yeah. organizations. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, that, that um, you could approve everything up to the last section. Okay. Um, Donna. Uh, I really appreciate all the work and discussion. And unfortunately, anybody in our budget has to stay sort of tuned. I would rather pass the management plan now and make changes as more information comes in and that's more information from the development core or the house fund or housing or homelessness whatever um, that we can be open to hearing people but i would like to give the management plan a approval for they can move forward tonight so you're suggesting that we just approve the whole thing, not um, leave out the last section. Yes. Okay. Well, there's uh, a motion and a second on the table. Um, I'm forgetting who made that now. Was it Dan? Was it was Jack? Was Jack made the motion. So Jack, um, is are you considering your motion still standing? Would, would you like to change it at all? What, what's your preference? I think my motion is as I made it if somebody wanted to move to amend it then we would take that up but uh, but i'm not moving to amend my own motion at this time okay and so if we wanted to give uh other folks a chance to weigh in um we could come in for the next meeting and and just revisit that decision or so yeah right and uh was dan the second on that i was uh, okay, and uh, how are you feeling about that? Yeah, I, I, uh, I am consistent with Jack's thought that we pass it tonight and we'll come back with the conversation if we need to uh, and amend. Okay. Um, all right, any other comments on uh, the plan? Okay. Um, so we'll at the very uh, have this on uh, the next agenda to uh, in, and invite uh, those agencies that might be affected um, to be a part of the discussion. Um, okay, so any further conversation? All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, so that passes and we'll also visit it next time. And uh, Kelly, if you wouldn't mind unsharing your screen, that would be great. Thank you. Um, okay, I think we really are just about done here. So we've also, we've had a report from, so next would be Connor. Um, no, not much. I, I think just, um... It, it, it's worth reminding uh, people to be very nice to city employees, you know, and as we look at this, we've had, you know, a third of the workforce out, you know, the fields are not going to be mowed in the same timely manner as they might normally be. City employees are looking at a knock in their cola. So yeah, hug a city employee if you see one and just want to thank everybody for their good work in us through the storm here. Um, you know, these are tough cuts, but um you know, nobody's losing their job. So that's a good thing with that level of cut. So thanks, Kelly and the staff, too. That's me. Thanks. Okay, Jay. Just a, a quick, 
Just a quick specific thanks to uh, Kari Bradley and and uh, Mary Malali at the uh, at the co-op for um, for partnering with us to be able to acquire masks um, for the city, which I think is great. And also just a, a quick shout out to if you were downtown today, you might have seen that uh, the uh, indefatigable Montpelier Live crew was out t um, putting out the flowers, and so it certainly is. A, uh, um, uh, a great, you know, it feels like summer when the flowers are out, right? So it was just uh, really great to see those out. And thanks to all the folks who put in their volunteer their time to make that happen for our downtown. Great. Thank you. Um, Dan. Um, just simply that, you know, along the lines of some of the other speakers that uh, Montpelier businesses are reopening and, um, you know, we've reached a level of certain reopen of safety and uh, they're back in business and ready to ready to serve. So it's it's good to see them open. It's good to be able to walk through Bear Pond for the first time. Um, and it's it's really wonderful to see the downtown come alive again. And I hope everyone out there, you know, has has the love for those businesses and and can continue to support them. Great. Um, all right, um, Jack. Um, two points to make. One, we've seen a lot of correspondence in the email and also a lot of discussion in, in Front Porch Forum about uh, one of the businesses in town, downtown Shaw, really making no effort, uh, assertedly, Making not, not making much effort to get people to wear masks, and you know that really doesn't comport with my experience because when when I've been there, virtually everyone has been wearing masks and they've done well at uh, doing the uh, one-way aisles. But uh, if they if they haven't posted the signs, and uh, I haven't been there since the sign requirement went up to see if uh, if they're required to do it but if they haven't posted the signs i hope that somebody would communicate with them that this is a city ordin ordinance that you're required to comply with um i don't know if you have an observation about that bill they they put they had the signs posted the day after we passed the ordinance. Okay, great. It's, it's, it's clearly something that the corporate did. It doesn't have the by order of Montpelier City Council on it, but it's definitely masks required to enter. Great. Um, and the other thing was uh, most of us got to participate in the uh, press conference the other day, introducing uh, our new chief, and I thought it was great and. Uh, one of the things that really stuck out for me was uh, when he talked about how he felt it's a real honor to be chosen to uh, serve as chief of police in this city. And I really appreciated that statement. It also made me, reminded me again of how much I feel it's an honor for me to have the opportunity to do this and, and serve the people of this city. And, uh, and you know, it's easy not to think about that all the time. It, uh, it becomes kind of uh, mundane, but, uh, but it really is. And that's all I've got. Great. Uh, Lauren. Yeah, thanks. Just real brief. Um, just wanted to reiterate my thanks to the many people who came out. It's great to see such community engagement. Um, my gratitude to the staff. I mean, the quality of work we're seeing across the board and knowing how short staffed you all are. It's really impressive and I just so appreciate it. Um, and echo Connors, you know, maybe I can't say hug, but a, a distance hug for, <laughs> for our staff. Um, and, and just wanted to, to again, welcome Chief Pete. And it, it'll be a very uh, exciting and interesting time. And we, we welcome you to the city and are, are so happy that, uh, that you're here. And that's it for me. Thanks. Great. Um, 
So I guess the only thing for me um, is I, I think I was probably remiss um, early station for not also um, just thanking our police department and uh, want to acknowledge that, uh, you know, we, especially in the earlier part of the conversation, like there, uh, there's obviously a lot of um, concern and questions um, out in the community right now. And uh, while we, you know, while we listen to them, I also just want to thank them for their work and um, just acknowledge that they are, they're working hard and we appreciate that. Um, so uh, just wanted to say that. And um, I think that is it for me. Um, so John, anything? I would just remind everybody that uh, water sewer payments and taxes are due Monday. Hey, Bill. Yeah, I'm not gonna keep you guys any longer. I guess just like to say thanks to uh, all the folks that organized the rally on Sunday. It was really fantastic. Uh, I've known two of them, Noel and Mary Ann, since they were babies. So it was, it was fun seeing them become community, young community leaders. So it was great. Great, super. All right, um, so I think that is everything. Uh, thanks for hanging in there, team, uh, so late. Uh, but uh, here we are. So without objection, we will consider this meeting adjourned 11-11. John, what time will the things be uh, there at the uh, police to, uh, to sign? Well, I'll bring the, the warrants. I'll bring them over tomorrow. Um, they're already, so, sorry to interrupt. They're already there. Oh, oh. Cool. great. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Great. Bye, folks. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.